Section Zero of The Man Wolf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Man Wolf by Emile Erkman and Alexandra Chatrian. Preliminary note by the translator it has often been remarked with perfect justice that the eminent french writers a translation of one of whose works is here attempted are singularly faithful in their adherence to historic truth remove the thread of obvious fiction which is indispensable to make these admirable productions romances or tales and what we have left is perfectly reliable history it is this feature mainly which gives the indescribable charm to their historical tales a charm powerfully realized in the original though less appreciable in an imperfect translation the same claim to perfect truthfulness in all essential points may be placed to the credit of the following roman populaire notwithstanding the startling supernatural element on which the story is founded erkman chatrian have not thought it right or necessary to depart in this case from their practice of abstaining from all prefaces or notes in every edition of their works yet perhaps the translator may be forgiven and even condoned with thanks if he ventures upon an explanation tending to show that the tale of hugh the wolf is not entirely founded upon superstition and the supernatural let his heart be changed from man's and let a beast's heart be given unto him such was the sentence pronounced and executed upon him of babylon whose pride called for abasement from the lord dr mead observes that there was known among the ancients a mental disorder called lycanthropy the victims of which fancied themselves wolves and went about howling and attacking and tearing sheep and young children so again virgil tells of the daughters of Pretus, who fancied themselves to be cows and running wildly about the pastures implarent falsus mugitibus argos this horrible disease appears happily to have been a rare one and recoveries from it have taken place for it is not destructive of the sufferer's life it has even been thoroughly cured after a lapse of many years dr pusey in a disquisition of great fullness upon the disease of nebuchadnezzar refers to a communication which he received from dr brown a commissioner of the board of lunacy for scotland in which he says my opinion is that in all mental powers or conditions the idea of personal identity is but rarely enfeebled and that it is never extinguished the ego and non-ego may be confused the ego however continues to preserve the personality all the angels devils dukes lords kings gods many that i have had under my care remained what they were before they became angels dukes etc in a sense and even nominally i have seen a man declaring himself the savior or saint paul sign himself james thompson and attend worship as regularly as if the notion of divinity had never entered into his head Escurole, a very trustworthy writer has a description of an extraordinary outbreak of lycanthropy in france in the jura at dole and other places in eastern france in the sixteenth century this terrible affliction began to manifest itself in france in the fifteenth century and the name of Lou Garot has been given to the sufferers these unhappy beings fly from the society of mankind and live in the woods the cemeteries or old ruins prowling about the open country only by night howling as they go they let their beard and nails grow and then seeing themselves armed with claws and covered with shaggy hair they become confirmed in the belief that they are wolves impelled by ferocity or want they throw themselves upon young children and tear kill and devour them those whom the french called lougarot were in german termed werewolves it may be observed on this that when the nails of the fingers and toes are cut they grow indefinitely but if they are allowed to grow unchecked they soon curve over the extremities 
form talons or claws and cease to grow answering to the scriptural account of the effects of the mental disorder of nebuchadnezzar of course for every case of real malady many were imputed or charged upon poor creatures who were driven to madness by groundless charges of witchcraft and sorcery and being loup-garou in secret many innocent people were in the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries burnt at the stake as wolves in human form a correspondent has kindly supplied the following information when in oud in india twenty-six years ago we heard of several instances of native babies being carried off out of the villages by she-wolves and placed with their whelps and brought up wild there there was one about when we were there partially reclaimed but retaining much of the savage nature imbibed with the wolf's milk and having been accustomed to go on all fours i e knees and elbows but i conclude these were not affected with lycanthropy with a few touches of his magic pencil the laureate has drawn a powerful picture of such a state of things in ancient britain of which we can scarcely deny the literal faithfulness it is not a poetic conception it is historic truth and ever and anon the wolf would steal the children and devour but now and then her own brood lost or dead lent her fierce teat to human sucklings and the children housed in her foul den there at their meat would growl and mock their foster mother on four feet till straightened they grew up to wolf-like men worse than the wolves coming of arthur the following tale in which the lycanthropy is far from being altogether a mere effort of the imagination appears to be founded upon the belief in the continued existence of this rare species of madness down to our own day or near it for the story seems to belong to the year eighteen thirty two the english reader will not fail to notice the correspondence between the title and the well-known designation of the illustrious head of the noble house of gravener whatever connection there may or may not be between that german hugh lupus of a thousand years ago and the truly british hugh lupus of our day all the base qualities of his supposed progenitor have disappeared in him who is adorned with all the qualities which make the english nobility rank as the pride and the flower of our land f a m the vicarage broughton in furness end of section zero recording by james k white chula vista chapter one of the man wolf this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sophie Owen. The Man-Wolf by Emile Erkman and Alexandra Chatrian. About Christmas time in the year 18 dash, as I was lying fast asleep at the Signy at Fribourg, my old friend Gideon Sperver broke abruptly into my room, crying, Fritz, I have good news for you. I am going to take you to Nideck, two leagues from this place. You know Nideck, the finest baronial castle in the country, a grand monument of the glory of our forefathers. Now, I had not seen Sperver, who was my foster father, for sixteen years. He had grown a full beard in that time, a huge fox-skin cap covered his head, and he was holding his lantern close under my nose. It was, therefore, only natural that I should answer, In the first place, let us do things in order. Tell me who you are. Who I am? What? Don't you remember Gideon Sperver? the Schwarzwald huntsman? You would not be so ungrateful, would you? Was it not I who taught you to set a trap, to lay wait for the foxes along the skirts of the woods, to start the dogs after the wild birds? Do you remember me now? Look at my left ear, with a frostbite. Now I know you. That left ear of yours has done it. Shake hands. Sperver, passing the back of his hand across his eyes, went on. You know Nideck. Of course I do. By reputation. What have you to do there? I am the Count's chief huntsman. And who has sent you? The young Countess Odile. Very good. How soon are we to start? This moment. The matter is urgent. The old Count is very ill, 
and his daughter has begged me not to lose a moment. The horses are quite ready. But Gideon, my dear fellow, just look out at the weather. It has been snowing three days without cessation. Oh, nonsense, we're not going out boar hunting. Put on your thick coat, buckle on your spurs, and let us prepare to start. I will order something to eat first. And he went out, first adding, Be sure to put on your cape. I could never refuse old Gideon anything. From my childhood he could do anything with me, with a nod or a sign. So I equipped myself and came into the coffee room. I knew, he said, that you would not let me go back without you. Eat every bit of this slice of ham, and let us drink a stirrup cup, for the horses are getting impatient. I have had your portmanteau put in. My portmanteau? What is that for? Yes, it will be all right. You will have to stay a few days at Nideck, that is indispensable, and I will tell you why presently. So we went down into the courtyard. At that moment two horsemen arrived, evidently tired out with riding, their horses in a perfect lather of foam. Sperver, who had always been a great admirer of a fine horse, expressed his surprise and admiration at these splendid animals. What beauties! They're of the Wallachian breed, I can see, as finely formed as deer and as swift. Nicholas, throw a cloth over them quickly, or they will take cold. The travellers, muffled in Siberian furs, passed close by us just as we were going to mount. I could only discern the long brown moustache of one and his singularly bright and sparkling eyes. They entered the hotel. The groom was holding our horses by the bridle. He wished us bon voyage, removed his hand, and we were off. Sperver rode a pure Mecklenburg. I was mounted on a stout cob bred in the Ardennes, full of fire. We flew over the snowy ground. In ten minutes we had left Fribourg behind us. The sky was beginning to clear up. As far as the eye could reach, we could distinguish neither road, path, nor track. Our only company were the ravens of the Black Forest, spreading their hollow wings wide over the banks of snow, trying one place after another unsuccessfully for food, and croaking, Misery! Misery! Gideon, with his weather-beaten countenance, his fur cloak and cap, galloped on ahead, whistling airs from the Freyschutz. Sometimes, as he turned, I could see the sparkling drops of moisture hanging from his long moustache. "'Well, Fritz, my boy, this is a fine winter's morning.' "'So it is, but it is rather severe, don't you think so?' "'I am fond of a clear, hard frost,' he replied. "'It promotes circulation. "'If our old minister Tobias had but the courage to start out in weather like this, "'he would soon put an end to his rheumatic pains.' "'I smiled, I am afraid, involuntarily. "'After an hour of this rapid pace, Sperver slackened his speed and let me come abreast of him. "'Fritz, I shall have to tell you the object of this journey at some time, I suppose.' I was beginning to think I ought to know what I am going about. A good many doctors have already been consulted. Indeed? Yes. Some came from Berlin in great wigs, who only asked to see the patient's tongue. Others from Switzerland examined him another way. The doctors from Paris stared at their patient through magnifying glasses to learn something from his physiognomy. But all their learning was wasted, and they got large fees in reward of their ignorance. Is that the way you speak of us medical gentlemen? I am not alluding to you at all. I have too much respect for you. And if I should happen to break my leg, I don't know that there is another that I should refer to yourself to treat me as a patient. But you have not discovered an optical instrument yet to tell us what is going on inside of us. How do you know that? At this reply, the worthy fellow looked at me doubtfully, as if he thought me a quack like the rest. Yet he replied, Well, Fritz, if you have indeed such a glass, it will be wanted now for the Count's complaint is internal. It is a terrible kind of illness, something like madness. You know that madness shows itself in either nine hours, nine days, or nine weeks. So it is said, but not having noticed this myself, I cannot say that it is so. Still, you know there are agues which return at periods of either three, six, or nine years. There are singular works in this machinery of ours. Whenever this human clockwork is wound up in some particular way, fever or indigestion or toothache returns at the very hour and day. Why, Gideon, I am quite aware of that. Those periodical complaints are the greatest trouble we have. I am sorry to hear it, for the Count's complaint is periodical. It comes back every year, on the same day, at the same hour. His mouth runs over with foam. His eyes stand out white and staring like great billiard balls. He shakes from head to foot, and he gnashes with his teeth. Perhaps this man has had serious troubles to go through. No, he has not. If his daughter would but consent to be married, he would be the happiest man alive. He is rich and powerful and full of honours. He possesses everything that the rest of the world is coveting. Unfortunately, his daughter persists in refusing every offer of marriage. 
She consecrates her life to God, and it harasses him to think that the ancient house of Nidek will become extinct. How did his illness come on? I asked. Suddenly, ten years ago, was the reply. All at once the honest fellow seemed to be recollecting himself. He took from his pocket a short pipe, filled it, and, having lighted it, one evening, said he, I was sitting alone with the Count in the armoury of the castle. It was about Christmas time. We had been hunting wild boars the whole day in the valleys of the Rathol, and had returned at night, bringing home with us two of our boarhounds ripped open from head to tail. It was just as cold as it is tonight, with snow and frost. The Count was pacing up and down the room with his chin upon his breast and his hands crossed behind him, like a man in profound thought. From time to time he stopped to watch the gathering snow on the high windows, and I was warming myself in the chimney corner, bewailing my dead hounds, and bestowing maledictions on all the wild boars that infest the Schwarzwald. Everybody at Nideck had been asleep a couple of hours, and not a sound could be heard but the tread and the clank of the Count's heavy spurred boots upon the flags. I remember well that a crow, no doubt driven by a gust of wind, came flapping its wings against the window panes, uttering a discordant shriek, and how the sheets of snow fell from the windows, and the windows suddenly changed from white to black. But what has all this to do with your master's illness? I interrupted. Let me go on, you will soon see. At that cry the Count suddenly gathered himself together with a shuddering movement. His eyes became fixed with a glassy stare, his cheeks were bloodless, and he bent his head forward, just like a hunter catching the sound of his approaching game. I went on warming myself, and I thought, won't he soon go to bed now? Before to tell you the truth, I was overcome with fatigue. All these details, Fritz, are still present in my memory. Scarcely had the bird of ill omen croaked its unearthly cry when the old clock struck eleven. At that moment, the Count turns on his heel. He listens. His lips tremble. I can see him staggering like a drunken man. He stretches out his hands. His jaws are tightly clenched, his eyes staring and white. I cried, My lord, what is the matter? But he began to laugh discordantly like a madman, stumbled and fell upon the stone floor, face downwards. I called for help. Servants came round. Sebalt took the Count by the shoulders. We removed him to a bed near the window. But just as I was loosening the Count's neckerchief, for I was afraid it was apoplexy, the Countess came and flung herself upon the body of her father, uttering such heart-rending cries that the very remembrance of them makes me shudder. Here Gideon took his pipe from his lips, knocked the ashes out onto the pommel of his saddle, and pursued his tale in a saddened voice. From that day, Fritz, nothing but evil days have come upon Nideck and better times seem to be far off. Every year, at the same day and hour, the Count has shuddering fits. The malady lasts from a week to a fortnight, during which she howls and yells so frightfully that it makes a man's blood run cold to hear him. Then he slowly recovers his usual health. He is still pale and weak, and moves trembling from one chair to another, starting at the least noise or movement, and fearful of his own shadow. The young Countess, the sweetest creature in the world, never leaves his side, but he cannot endure her while the fit is upon him. He roars at her, Go, leave me this moment. I have enough to endure without seeing you hanging about me. It is a horrible sight. I am always close at his heels in the chase, I who sound the horn when he has killed the forest beasts. I am at the head of all his retainers, and I would give my life for his sake. Yet when he is at his worst, I can hardly keep my hands from his throat. I am so horrified at the way in which he treats his beautiful daughter. Spurther looked dangerously wroth for a moment, clapped both his spurs to his mount, and we rode on at a hard gallop. I had fallen into a reverie. The cure of a complaint of this description appeared to me more than doubtful, even impossible. It was evidently a mental disorder. To fight against it with any hope of success, it would be needful to trace it back to its origin, and this would, no doubt, be too remote for successful investigation. All these reflections perplexed me greatly. The old huntsman's story, far from strengthening my hopes, only depressed me. Not a very favourable condition to ensure success. At about three we came in sight of the ancient castle of Nidek, on the verge of the horizon. In spite of the great distance we could distinguish the projecting turrets, apparently suspended from the angles of the edifice. It was but a dim outline barely distinguishable from the blue sky, but soon the red points of the Vosges became visible. At that moment Spurvo drew in his bridle and said, Fritz, we shall have to get there before night. Onward! But it was in vain that he spurred and lashed. 
The horse stood rooted to the ground, his ears thrown back, his nostrils dilated, his sides panting, his legs firmly planted in an attitude of resistance. "'What is the matter with the beast?' cried Gideon in astonishment. "'Do you see anything, Fritz? Surely!' He broke off abruptly, pointing with his whip at a dark form in the snow fifty yards off on the slope of the hill. "'The Black Plague!' he exclaimed, with a voice of distress which almost robbed me of my self-possession. Following the indication of his outstretched whip, I discerned with astonishment an aged woman crouching on the snowy ground, with her arms clasped about her knees, and so tattered that her red elbows came through her tattered sleeves. A few ragged locks of grey hung about her long, scraggy, red and vulture-like neck. Strange to say, a bundle of some kind lay upon her knees, and her haggard eyes were directed upon distant objects in the white landscape. Spencer drew off to the left, giving the hideous object as wide a berth as he could, and I had some difficulty in following him. Now, I cried, what is all this for? Are you joking? Joking? Assuredly not. I never joke about such serious matters. I am not given to superstition, but I confess that I am alarmed at this meeting. Then turning his head, and noticing that the old woman had not moved, and that her eyes were fixed upon the same one spot, he appeared to gather a little courage. Fritz, he said solemnly, you are a man of learning. You know many things of which I know nothing at all. Well, I can tell you this, that a man is in the wrong who laughs at a thing because he can't understand it. I have good reasons for calling this woman the Black Plague. She is known by that name in the whole Black Forest, but here at Nideck she has earned that title by supreme right. And the good man pursued his way without further observation. Now, Sperver, just explain what you mean, I asked. But I don't understand you. That woman is the ruin of us all. She is a witch. She is the cause of it all. It is she who is killing the Count by inches. How is that possible? I exclaimed. How could she exercise such a baneful influence? I cannot tell how it is. All I know is that on the very day that the attack comes on, at the very moment, if you will ascend the Beacon Tower, you will see the Black Plague squatting down like a dark speck on the snow just between the Tiefenbach and the Castle of Nideck. She sits there alone, crouching close to the snow. Every day she comes a little nearer, and every day the attacks grow worse. You would think he hears her approach. Sometimes, on the first day, when the fits of trembling have come over him, he has said to me, Gideon, I feel her coming. I hold him by the arms and restrain the shuddering somewhat, but he still repeats, stammering and struggling with his agony, and his eyes staring and fixed. She is coming. Nearer. Oh, oh, she comes. Then I go up Hugh Lupus's tower. I survey the country. You know I have a keen eye for distant objects. At last, amidst the grey mists afar off, between sky and earth, I can just make out a dark speck. The next morning that black spot has grown larger. The Count of Nideck goes to bed with chattering teeth. The next day after we can make out the figure of the old hag. The fierce attacks begin. The Count cries out, the day after, the witch is at the foot of the mountain, and the consequence is that the Count's jaws are set like a vice, his mouth foams, his eyes turn in his head. Vile creature! Twenty times I have had her within gunshot, and the Count has bid me shed no blood. No, Sperver, no, let us have no bloodshed! Poor man! He is sparing the life of the wretch who is draining his life from him, for she is killing him, Fritz, he is reduced to skin and bone! My good friend Gideon was in too great a rage with the unhappy woman to make it possible to bring him back to calm reason. Besides, who can draw the limits around the region of possibility? Every day we see the range of reality extending more widely. Unseen and unknown influences, marvellous correspondences, invisible bonds, some kind of mysterious magnetism, are, on the one hand, proclaimed as undoubted facts, and denied, on the other, with irony and scepticism. And yet who can say that after a while there will not be some astonishing revelations breaking in the midst of us all when we least expect it? In the midst of so much ignorance it seems easy to lay a claim to wisdom and shrewdness. I therefore only begged Sperver to moderate his anger, and by no means to fire upon the Black Plague, warning him that such a proceeding would bring serious misfortune upon him. Puh! he cried. At the very worst they could but hang me. But that, I remarked, was a good deal for an honest man to suffer. "'Not at all!' he cried. "'It is but one death out of many. "'You are suffocated, that is all. 
I would just as soon die of that as of a hammer falling on my head, as an apoplexy, or not be able to sleep, or smoke, or swallow, or digest my food. You, Gideon, with your grey beard, you have learnt a peculiar mode of reasoning. Grey beard or not, that is my way of seeing things. I always keep a ball in my double barrel gun at the witch's service. From time to time I put in a fresh charge, and if I get the chance... He only added an expressive gesture. Quite wrong, Sperver, quite wrong. I agree with the Count of Nideck, and I say no bloodshed. Oceans cannot wipe away bloodshed and anger. Think of that, and discharge that barrel against the first boar you meet. These words seemed to make some impression upon the old huntsman. He hung down his head and looked thoughtful. We were then climbing the wooded steeps which separate the poor village of Tiefenbach from the castle of Nideck. Night had closed in. As it always happens with us after our bright, clear winter's day, snow was again beginning to fall. Heavy flakes dropped and melted upon our horses' manes, who were beginning now to pluck up their spirits at the near prospect of the comfortable stable. Now and then Sperver looked over his shoulder with evident uneasiness, and I myself was not altogether free from a feeling of apprehension in thinking of the strange account which the huntsman had given me of his master's complaint. Besides all this, there is a certain harmony between external nature and the spirit of a man, and I know of nothing more depressing than a gloomy forest loaded in every branch with thick snow and hoar frost, and moaning in the north wind. The gaunt and weird-looking trunks of the tall pines and the gnarled and massive oaks look mournfully upon you, and fill you with melancholy thoughts. As we ascended the rocky eminence, the oaks became fewer, and scattered birches, straight and white as marble pillars, divided the dark green of the forest pines, when in a moment, as we issued from a thicket, the ancient stronghold stood before us in a heavy mass, its dark surface studded with brilliant points of light. Sperver had pulled up before a deep gateway between two towers, barred in by an iron grating. "'Here we are!' he cried, throwing the reins on the horses' necks. He laid hold of the deer's foot bell-handle, and the clear sound of a bell broke the stillness. After waiting a few minutes, the light of a lantern flickered in the deep archway, showing us in its semicircular frame of ruddy light the figure of a humpbacked dwarf, yellow-bearded, broad-shouldered, and wrapped in furs from head to foot. You might have thought him in the deep shadow some gnome or evil spirit of earth realised out of the dreams of the Nibelungen leader. He came towards us at a very leisurely pace, and laid his great flat features close against the massive grating, straining his eyes and trying to make us out in the darkness in which we were standing. "'Is that you, Sperver?' he asked in a hoarse voice. "'Open at once, Knapwurst, was the quick reply. "'Don't you know how cold it is?' "'Oh, I know you now,' cried the little man. "'There's no mistaking you. "'You always speak as if you were going to gobble people up.' "'The door opened, and the dwarf, examining me with his lantern, "'with an odd expression in his face, received me with, "'Welcome in, Herr Doctor,' "'but which seemed to say besides, "'Here is another who will have to go away again, as others have done.' "'Then he quietly closed the door, whilst we alighted, "'and came to take our horses by the bridle.' End of chapter one. Recording by Sophie Owen. Chapter two of The Man Wolf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Man Wolf by Emile Erkman and Alexandre Chatrian. Chapter 2 Following Sperver, who ascended the staircase with rapid steps, I was still able to convince myself that the castle of Nidic had not an undeserved reputation. It was a true stronghold, partly cut out of the rock, such as used formerly to be called a chateau d'embuscade. Its lofty vaulted arches re-echoed afar with our steps and the outside air blowing with sharp gusts through the loopholes, narrow slits made for the archers of former days, caused our torches to flare and flicker from space to space over the faintly illuminated protruding lines of the arches as they caught the uncertain light. Sperver knew every nook and corner of this vast place. He turned now to the right, and now to the left, and I followed him breathless. 
at last he stopped on a spacious landing and said to me now fritz i will leave you for a minute with the people of the castle to inform the young countess odile of your arrival do just what you think right then you will find the head butler tobias offenlock an old soldier of the regiment of nidick he campaigned in france under the count and you will see his wife a frenchwoman marie Legoute, who pretends that she comes of a high family and why should she not of course she might but between ourselves she was nothing but a contenir in the grand armee she brought in tobias offenlock upon her cart with one of his legs gone and he has married her out of gratitude you understand that will do but open for i am numb with cold and i was about to push on but sperver as obstinate as any other good german was not going to let me off without edifying me upon the history of the people with whom my lot was going to be cast for a while and holding me by the frogs of my fur coat he went on there's besides sebalt craft the master of the hounds he is rather a dismal fellow but he is not his equal at sounding the horn and there will be karl trump the butler and christian becker and everybody unless they have all gone to bed thereupon sperver pushed open the door and i stood in some surprise on the threshold of a high dark hall the guard-room of the old lords of nidick my eyes fell at first upon the three windows at the farther end looking out upon the sheer rocky precipice on the right stood an old sideboard in dark oak and upon it a cask glasses and bottles on the left a gothic chimney overhung with its heavy massive mantelpiece empurpled by the brilliant roaring fire underneath and ornamented on both front and sides with wood carvings representing scenes from boar hunts in the middle ages and along the centre of the apartment a long table upon which stood a huge lamp throwing its light upon a dozen pewter tankards at one glance i saw all this but the human portion of the scene interested me most i recognized the major domo or head butler by his wooden leg of which i had already heard he was of low stature round fat and rosy and his knees seldom coming within an easy range of his eyesight a nose red and bulbous like a ripe raspberry on his head he wore a huge hemp-coloured wig bulging out over his fat poll a coat of light green plush with steel buttons as large as a five-franc piece velvet breeches silk stockings and shoes garnished with silver buckles he was just with his hand upon the top of the cask with an air of inexpressible satisfaction beaming upon his ruddy features and his eyes glowing in profile from the reflection of the fire like a couple of watch glasses his wife the worthy marie Legoute, her spare figure draped in voluminous folds her long and sallow face like a skin of chamois leather was playing at cards with two servants who were gravely seated on straight-backed armchairs certain small split pegs were seated astride across the nose of the old woman and that of another player whilst the third was significantly and cunningly winking his eye and seeming to enjoy seeing them victimized upon these new caudine forks how many cards he was asking two answered the old woman and you christian two aha uh -huh. now i've got you then cut the king now the ace here's one here's another another peg mother this will teach you once more not to brag about french games monsieur christian you don't treat the fair sex with proper respect at cards you respect nobody but you see i have no room left pooh on a nose like yours there's always room for more at that moment sperver cried mates here i am ha ah, gideon back already marie Legoute shook off her numerous pegs with a jerk of her head the big butler drank off his glass everybody turned our way is monseigneur better the butler answered with a doubtful ejaculation is he just the same much about answered marie Legoute, who never took her eyes off me sperver noticed this 
let me introduce you to my foster son dr fritz from the black forest he answered proudly now we shall see a change master toby now that fritz has come the abominable fits will be put an end to if i had but been listened to earlier but better late than never marie lagoutte was still watching us and her scrutiny seemed satisfactory for addressing the major domo she said now monsieur offenlock hand the doctor a chair move about a little do there you stand with your mouth wide open just like a fish ah sir these germans and the good man jumping up as if moved by a spring came to take off my cloak permit me sir you are very kind my dear lady give it to me what terrible weather ah monsieur what a dreadful country this is so monseigneur is neither better nor worse said sperver shaking the snow off his cap we are not too late then ho oh, casper casper a little man who had one shoulder higher than the other and his face spotted with innumerable freckles came out of the chimney corner here i am very good now get ready for this gentleman the bedroom at the end of the long galley hugh's room you know which i mean yes sperver in a minute and you will take with you as you go the doctor's knapsack knapwurst will give it you as for supper never you mind that is my business very well then i will depend upon you the little man went out and gideon after taking off his cape left us to go and inform the young countess of my arrival i was rather overpowered with the attentions of marie lagoutte give up that place of yours sibald she cried to the kennel-keeper you are roasted enough by this time sit near the fire monsieur le docteur you must have very cold feet stretch out your legs that's the way then holding out her snuff-box to me do you take snuff no dear madam with many thanks that is a pity she answered filling both nostrils it is the most delightful habit she slipped her snuff-box back into her apron pocket and went on you are come not a bit too soon monseigneur had a second attack yesterday it was an awful attack was it not monsieur offenlock furious indeed answered the head butler gravely it is not surprising she continued when a man takes no nourishment fancy monsieur that for two days he has never tasted broth nor a glass of wine added the major-domo crossing his hands over his portly well-lined person as it seemed expected of me i expressed my surprise on which tobias offenlock came to sit at my right hand and said doctor take my advice order him a bottle a day of marco bruner and chimed in marie lagoutte a wing of a chicken at every meal the poor man is frightfully thin we have got marco bruner sixty years in a bottle added the major-domo for it is a mistake of madame offenlock's to suppose that the french drank it all and you had better order while you are about it now and then a good bottle of johannesburg that is the best wine to set a man up again time was remarked the master of the hounds in a dismal voice time was when monseigneur hunted twice a week then he was well when he left off hunting then he fell ill of course it could not be otherwise observed marie lagoutte the open air gives you an appetite the doctor had better order him to hunt three times a week to make up for lost time two would be enough replied the man of dogs with the same gravity quite enough the hounds must have their rest dogs have just as much right to rest as we have there was a few moments silence during which i could hear the wind beating against the window panes and rush sighing and wailing through the loopholes into the towers sibalt sat with legs across and his elbow resting on his knee gazing into the fire with unspeakable dolefulness marie lagoutte after having refreshed herself with a fresh pinch was settling her snuff into shape in its box while i sat thinking on the strange habit people indulge in of pressing their advice upon those who don't want it at this moment the major-domo rose will you have a glass of wine doctor 
said he, leaning over the back of my armchair. Thank you, but I never drink before seeing a patient. What? Not even one little glass? Not the smallest glass you could offer me. He opened his eyes wide and looked with astonishment at his wife. The doctor is right, she said. I am quite of his opinion. I prefer to drink with my meat and to take a glass of cognac afterwards. That is what the ladies do in France. Cognac is more fashionable than Kirschwasser. Marie Legoute had hardly finished with her dissertation when Sperver opened the door quietly and beckoned me to follow him. I bowed to the honorable company, and as I was entering the passage, I could hear that lady saying to her husband, That is a nice young man. He would have made a good-looking soldier. Sperver looked uneasy, but said nothing. I was full of my own thoughts. A few steps under the darkling vaults of Nidic, completely effaced from my memory, the queer figures of Tobias and Marie Legoute, poor, harmless creatures existing like bats under the mighty wing of the vulture. Soon Gideon brought me into a sumptuous apartment, hung with violet-colored velvet, relieved with gold. A bronze lamp stood in a corner, its brightness toned down by a globe of ground crystal. Thick carpets, soft as the turf on the hills, made our steps noiseless. It seemed a fit abode for silence and meditation. On entering, Sperver lifted the heavy draperies which fell around an Aji window. I observed him straining his eyes to discover something in the darkened distance. He was trying to make out whether the witch still lay there, crouching down upon the snow in the midst of the plain. But he could see nothing, for there was deep darkness over all. But I had gone on a few steps, and came in sight by the faint rays of the lamp of a pale, delicate figure seated in a Gothic chair not far from the sick man. It was Odile of Nidic. Her long black silk dress, her gentle expression of calm self-devotion and complete resignation, the ideal angel-like cast of her sweet features, recalled to one's mind those mysterious creations of the pencil in the Middle Ages when painting was pursued as a true art but which modern imitators have found themselves obliged to give up in despair, while at the same time they never can forget them. I cannot say what thoughts passed rapidly through my mind at the sight of this fair creature, but certainly much of devotion mingled with my sentiments. A sense of music and harmony swept sadly through my soul with faint impressions of the old ballads of my childhood, of those pious songs with which the kind nurses of the Black Forest rocked to peaceful sleep our infant sorrows. At my approach, Odile rose. You are very welcome, Monsieur le Docteur, she said with touching kindness and simplicity. Then, pointing with her finger to a recess where lay the Count, she added, There is my father. I bowed respectfully and without answering, for I felt deeply affected and drew near to my patient. Sperver, standing at the head of the bed, held up the lamp with one hand, holding his fur cap in the other. Odile stood at my left hand. The light, softened by the subdued light of the globe of ground crystal, fell softly on the face of the Count. At once I was struck with a strangeness in the physiognomy of the Count of Nidic, and in spite of all the admiration which his lovely daughter had at once obtained from me, my first conclusion was, What an old wolf! And such he seemed to be, indeed. A gray head, covered with short, close hair, strangely full behind the ears, and drawn out in the face to a portentous length. The narrowness of his forehead, up to its summit, widening over the eyebrows, which were shaggy, and met pointing downwards over the bridge of the nose, imperfectly shading with their sable outline the cold and inexpressive eyes. The short, rough beard, irregularly spread over the angular and bony outline of the mouth, Every feature of this man's dreadful countenance made me shudder, and strange notions crossed my mind about the mysterious affinities between man and the lower creation. But I resisted my first impressions and took the sick man's hand. It was dry and wiry, yet small and strong. I found the pulse quick, feverish, and denoting great irritability. What was I to do? I stood considering. On the one side stood the young lady, 
anxiously trying to read a little hope in my face on the other sperver equally anxious and watching my every movement a painful constraint lay therefore upon me yet i saw that there was nothing definite that could be attempted yet i dropped the arm and listened to the breathing from time to time a convulsive sob heaved the sick man's heart after which followed a succession of quick short respirations a kind of nightmare was evidently weighing him down epilepsy perhaps or tetanus but what could be the cause or origin i turned round full of painful thoughts is there any hope sir asked the young countess yesterday's crisis is drawing to its close i answered we must see if we can prevent its recurrence is there any possibility of it sir i was about to answer in general medical terms not daring to venture any positive assertions when the distant sound of the bell at the gate fell upon our ears visitors said sperver there was a moment's silence go and see who it is said odile whose brow was for a minute shaded with anxiety how can one be hospitable to strangers at such a time it is hardly possible but the door opened and a rosy face with golden hair appeared in the shadow and said in a whisper it is the baron of zimmer bluderich with a servant and he asks for shelter in the nidic he has lost his way among the mountains very well gretchen answered the young countess kindly go and tell the steward to attend to the baron de zimmer inform him that the count is very ill and that this alone prevents him from doing the honours as he would wish wake up some of our people to wait on him and let everything be done properly nothing could exceed the sweet and noble simplicity of the young chatelaine in giving her orders if an air of distinction seems hereditary in some families it is surely because the exercise of the duties conferred by the possession of wealth has a natural tendency to ennoble the whole character and bearing these thoughts passed through my mind whilst admiring the grace and gentleness in every movement of odile of nidic and that clearness and purity of outline which is only found marked in the features of the higher aristocracy and i could recall nothing to my recollection equal to this ideal beauty go now gretchen said the young countess and make haste the attendant went out and i stood a few seconds under the influence of the charm of her manner odile turned round and addressing me you see sir said she with a sad smile one may not indulge in grief without a pause we must divide ourselves between our affection within and the world without true madam i replied souls of the highest order are for the common property and advantage of the unhappy the lost wayfarer the sick the hungry poor each has his claim for a share for god has made them like the stars of heaven to give light and pleasure to all the deep fringed eyelids veiled the blue eyes for a moment while sperver pressed my hand presently she pursued ah if you could but restore my father's health as i have had the pleasure to inform you madam the crisis is past the return must be anticipated if possible do you hope that it may with god's help madam it is not impossible i will think carefully over it odile much moved came with me to the door sperver and i crossed the anteroom where a few servants were waiting for the orders of their mistress we had just entered the corridor when gideon who was walking first turned quickly round and placing both his hands on my shoulders said come fritz i am to be depended upon for keeping a secret what is your opinion i think there is no cause for apprehension for to-night i know that so you told the countess but how about to-morrow to-morrow yes don't turn round i suppose you cannot prevent the return of the complaint do you think fritz he will die of it it is possible but hardly probable well done cried the good man springing from the ground with joy if you don't think so that means that you are sure and taking my arm he drew me into the gallery we had just reached it when the baron of zimmer bluderich and his groom appeared there also marshalled by sebalt 
with a lighted torch in his hand they were on their way to their chambers and those two figures with their cloaks flung over their shoulders their loose hungarian boots up to the knees the body closely girt with long dark green laced and frogged tunics and the bearskin cap closely and warmly covering the head were very picturesque objects by the flickering light of the pine torch there whispered sperver if i am not very much mistaken those are our freeborg friends they have followed very close upon our heels you are quite right they are the men i recognize the younger by his tall slender figure his aquiline nose and his long drooping moustache they disappeared through a side passage gideon took a torch from the wall and guided me through quite a maze of corridors aisles narrow and wide passages under high vaulted roofs and under low-built arches who could remember there seemed no end here is the hall of the margraves said he here is the portrait gallery and this is the chapel where no mass has been said since louis the bold became a protestant all these particulars had very little interest for me after reaching the end we had again to go down steps at last we happily came to the end of our journey before a low massive door sperver took a huge key out of his pocket and handing me the torch said mind the light look out at the same time he pushed open the door and the cold outside air rushed into the narrow passage the torch flared and sent out a volley of sparks in all directions I thought I saw a dark abyss before me, and recoiled with fear. Ha, 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 cried the huntsman, opening his mouth from ear to ear. You are surely not afraid, Fritz. Come on, don't be frightened. We are upon the parapet between the castle and the old tower. And my friend advanced to set me the example. The narrow granite-walled platform was deep in snow, swept in swirling banks by the angry winds anyone who had seen our flaring torch from below would have asked what are they doing up there in the clouds what can they want at this time of the night perhaps i thought within myself the witch is looking up at us and that idea gave me a fit of shuddering i drew closer together the folds of my horseman's cloak and with my hand upon my hat i set off after sperver at a run he was raising the light above his head to show me the road and was moving forward rapidly we rushed into the tower and then into hugh lupus's chamber a bright fire saluted us here with its cheerful rays how delightful to be once more sheltered by thick walls i had stopped while sperver closed the door and contemplating this ancient abode i cried thank god we shall rest now with a well-furnished table before us added gideon don't stand there with your nose in the air but rather consider what is before you a leg of a kid a couple of roast fowls a pike fresh caught with parsley sauce cold meats and hot wines that's what i like casper has attended to my orders like a real good fellow gideon spoke the truth the meats were cold and the wines were warm for in front of the fire stood a row of small bottles under the gentle influence of the heat at the sight of these good things my appetite rose in me wonderfully but sperver who understood what is comfortable stopped me fritz said he don't let us be in too great a hurry we have plenty of time the falls won't fly away your boots must hurt you after eight hours on horseback it is pleasant to take off one's boots that's my principle now sit down put your boot between my knees there goes one off now the other that's the way now put your feet into these slippers take off your cloak and throw this lighter coat over your shoulders now we are ready and with his cheery summons i sat down with him to work one on each side of the table remembering the german proverb thirst comes from the evil one but good wine from the powers above end of chapter two recording by james k white chula vista Chapter Three of the Man Wolf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Man Wolf by Emile Erkman and Alexandre Chatrion. Chapter 3 we ate with the vigorous appetite which ten hours in the snows of the black forest would be sure to provoke sperver making indiscriminate attacks upon the kid the fowls and the fish murmured with his mouth full the woods the lakes and rivers and the heathery hills are full of good things then he leaned over the back of his chair and laying his hand on the first bottle that came to hand he added and we have hills green in spring purple in autumn when the grapes ripen your health fritz yours gideon we were a wonder to behold we reciprocally admired each other the fire crackled the forks rattled teeth were in full activity bottles gurgled glasses jingled while outside the wintry blast the high moaning mountain winds were mournfully chanting the dirge of the year that strange wailing hymn with which they accompany the shock of the tempest and the swift rush of the gray clouds charged with snow and hail while the pale moon lights up the grim and ghastly battle scene but we were snug under cover and our appetite was fading away into history sperver had filled the wiederkalm the come again with old wine of brumberg the sparkling froth fringed its ample borders he presented it to me saying drink the health of yeri hans lord of nidic drink to the last drop and show them that you mean it which was done then he filled it again and repeating with a voice that re-echoed among the old walls to the recovery of my noble master the high and mighty lord of nidic he drained it also then a feeling of satisfied repletion stole gently over us and we felt pleased with everything i fell back in my chair with my face directed to the ceiling and my arms hanging lazily down i began dreamily to consider what sort of a place i had got into it was a low vaulted ceiling cut out of the live rock almost oven shaped and hardly twelve feet high at the highest point at the farther end i saw a sort of deep recess where lay my bed on the ground and consisting as i thought i could see of a huge bearskin above and I could not tell what below. And within this, yet another smaller niche, with a figure of the Virgin Mary carved out of the same granite, and crowned with a bunch of withered grass. You are looking over your room, said Spencer. Parbleu! It is none of the biggest or grandest, not quite like the rooms in the castle. We are now in Hugh Lupus's tower, a place as old as the mountain itself, going as far back as the days of Charlemagne. In those days, as you see, people had not yet learned to build arches high, round, or pointed. They worked right into the rock. Well, for all that, you have put me in strange lodgings. Don't be mistaken, Fritz. It is the place of honor. It is here that the Count put all his most distinguished friends. Mind that. Hugh Lupus's tower is the most honorable accommodation we have. And who was Hugh Lupus? why hugh the wolf to be sure he was the head of the family of nidic a rough and ready warrior i can tell you he came to settle up here with a score of horsemen and halberdiers of his following they climbed up this rock the highest rock amongst these mountains you will see this to-morrow they constructed this tower and proclaimed now we are the masters woe befall the miserable wretches who shall pass without paying toll to us we will tear the wool off their backs and their hide too if need be from this watch-tower we shall command a view of the far distance all round the passes of the rathal of steinbach koch plate and of the whole line of the black forest are under our eye let the jew peddlers and the dealers beware and the noble fellows did what they promised hugh the wolf was at their head knapworth told me all about it sitting up one night who is knapwurst that little humpback who opened the gate for us he is an odd fellow fritz and almost lives in the library so you have a man of learning at nidic yes we have the rascal instead of confining himself to the porter's lodge his proper place 
all the day over he is amongst the dusty books and parchments belonging to the family he comes and goes along the shelves of the library just like a big cat knapworth knows our story better than we know it ourselves he would tell you the longest tales fritz if you would only let him he calls them chronicles <laughs> and sperver with the wine mounting a little into his head began to laugh he could hardly say why so then gideon you call this tower hugh's tower the hugh lupus tower haven't i told you so already what are you so astonished at nothing particular but you are i can see it in your face you are thinking of something strange what is it oh never mind it is not the name of the tower which surprises me what i am wondering at is how it is that you an old poacher who had never lived anywhere since you were a boy but amongst the fir forests between the snowy summits of the Baldhorn and the passes of the rathal you who during all your prime of life thought it the finest of fun to laugh at the count's gamekeepers and to scour the mountain paths of the schwarzwald and boat the bushes there and breathe the free air and bask in the bright sunshine amongst the hills and valleys here i find you at the end of sixteen years of such a life shut up in this red granite hole that is what surprises me and what i cannot understand come sperber light your pipe and tell me all about it the old poacher took out of his leathern jacket a bit of a blackened pipe he filled it at his leisure gathered up in the hollow of his hand a live ember which he placed upon the bowl of his pipe then with his eyes dreamily cast up to the ceiling he answered meditatively old falcons gerfalcons and hawks when they have long swept the plains end their lives in a hole in a rock sure enough i am fond of the wide expanse of sky and land i always was fond of it but instead of perching by night upon a high branch of a tall tree rocked by the wind i now prefer to return to my cavern to drink a glass to pick a bone of venison and dry my plumage before a warm fire the count of nidick does not disdain sperver the old hawk the true man of the woods one evening meeting me by moonlight he frankly said to me old comrade you hunt only by night come and hunt by day with me you have a sharp beak and strong claws well hunt away if such is your nature but hunt by my license for i am the eagle upon these mountains and my name is nidick sperver was silent a few minutes then he resumed that was just what suited me and now i hunt as i used to do and i quietly drink along with a friend my bottle of Affenthal, or at that moment there was a shock that made the door vibrate sperver stopped and listened it's a gust of wind i said no it's something else don't you hear the scratching of claws it is a dog that has escaped open liberle open blitzen cried the huntsman rising but he had not gone a couple of steps when a formidable-looking hound of the danish breed broke into the tower and ran to lay his heavy paws on his master's shoulders licking his beard and his cheeks with his long rose-colored tongue uttering all the while short barks and yelps expressive of his joy sperver had passed his arm round the dog's neck and turning to me said fritz what man could love me as this dog does do look at his head these eyes these teeth he uncovered the animal's teeth displaying a set of fangs that would have pulled down and rent a buffalo then repelling him with difficulty for the dog was redoubling his caresses down liverle i know you love me if you did not who would never had i seen so tremendous a dog as this liverle his height attained two feet and a half he would have been a most formidable creature in an attack his forehead was broad flat and covered with fine soft hair his eye was keen his paws of great length his sides and legs a woven mass of muscles and nerves broad over the back and shoulders slender and tapering towards the hind legs but he had no scent if such monstrous and powerful hounds were endowed with the scent of the terrier there would soon be an end of game 
sperver had returned to his seat and was passing his hand over Leverlet's massive head with pride and enumerating to me his excellent qualities Leverlet seemed to understand him see fritz that dog will throttle a wolf with one snap of his jaws for courage and strength he is perfection he is not five years old but he is in his prime i need not tell you that he is trained to hunt the boar every time we come across a herd of them i tremble for leverlet his attack is too straightforward he flies on the game as straight as an arrow that is why i am afraid of the brute's tusks lie down leverlet lie on your back the dog obeyed and presented to view his flesh-coloured sides look fritz at that long white seam without any hair upon it from under the thigh right up to the chest a boar did that poor creature he was holding him fast by the ear and would not let go we tracked the two by the blood i was the first up with them seeing my lever lay i gave a shout i jumped off my horse i caught him between my arms flung him into my cloak and brought him home i was almost beside myself happily the vital parts had not been wounded i sewed up his belly in spite of his howling and yelling for he suffered fearfully but in three days he was already licking his wound and a dog who licks himself is already saved you remember that leverlet eh and aren't we fonder of each other now than ever i was quite moved with the affection of the man for that dog and of the dog for his master they seemed to look into the very depths of each other's souls the dog wagged his tail and the man had tears in his eyes sperber went on what amazing strength do you see fritz he has burst his cord to get to me a rope of six strands he found out my track and here he is here leverlet catch and he threw to him the remains of the leg of kid the jaws opened wide and closed again with a terrible crash and sperver looking at me significantly said fritz if he were to grip you by your breeches you would not get away so easily nor any one else i suppose the dog went to stretch himself at his ease full length under the mantel shelf with the leg fast between his mighty paws he began to tear it into pieces sperver looked at him out of the corner of his eye with great satisfaction the bone was falling fast into small fragments in the powerful mill that was crushing it leverlet was partial to marrow aha fritz if you were requested to fetch that bone away from him what would you say i should think it a mission requiring extraordinary delicacy and tact then we broke out into a hearty laugh and sperver seated in his leathern easy-chair with his left arm thrown back over his head one of his manly legs over a stool and the other in front of a huge log which was dripping at its end with the oozing sap and darted volumes of light gray smoke to the roof i was still contemplating the dog when suddenly recollecting our broken conversation i went on now sperver you have not told me everything when you left the mountain for the castle was it not on account of the death of gertrude your good excellent wife gideon frowned and a tear dimmed his eye he drew himself up and shaking out the ashes of his pipe upon his thumbnail he said true my wife is dead that drove me from the woods i could not look upon the valley of roche cruz without pain i turned my flight in this direction I hunt less in the woods and i can see it all from higher up and if by chance the pack trails off in that direction i let them go i turn back and try to think of something else sperver had grown taciturn with his head drooped upon his breast his eyes fixed on the stone floor he sat silent i felt sorry to have awoke these melancholy recollections in him then my thoughts once more returning to the black plague groveling in the snow i felt a shivering horror how strange just one word had sent us into a train of unhappy thoughts a whole world of remembrances was called up by a chance i know not how long this silence lasted when a growl deep long and terrible like distant thunder made us start we looked at the dog the half-knot bone was still between his forepaws 
but with head raised high ears cocked up and flashing eye he was listening intently listening to the silence as it were and an angry quivering ran down the length of his back sperver and i fixed on each other anxious eyes yet there was not a sound not a breath outside for the wind had gone down nothing could be heard but the deep protracted growl which came from deep down the chest of the noble hound suddenly he sprang up and bounded impetuously against the wall with a hoarse rough bark of fearful loudness the walls re-echoed just as if a clap of thunder had rattled the casements leverlay with his head low down seemed to want to see through the granite and his lips drawn back from his teeth discovered them to the very gums displaying two close rows of fangs white as ivory still he growled for a moment he would stop abruptly with his nose snuffing close to the wall next the floor with strong respirations then he would rise again in a fresh rage and with his forepaws seemed as if he would break through the granite we watched in silence without being able to understand what caused his excitement another yell of rage more terrible than the first made us spring from our seats liberle what possesses you are you mad he seized a log and began to sound the wall which only returned the dead hard sound of a wall of solid rock there was no hollow in it yet the dog stood in the posture of attack decidedly you must have been dreaming bad dreams said the huntsman come lie down and don't worry us any more with your nonsense at that moment a noise outside reached our ears the door opened and the fat honest countenance of tobias offenlock with his lantern in one hand and his stick in the other his three-cornered hat on his head appeared smiling and jovial in the opening salute le honorable compagna he cried as he entered what are you doing here it was that rascal liverlet who made all that row just fancy he set himself up against that wall as if he smelt a thief what could he mean why parbleu he heard the dot dot of my wooden leg to be sure stumping up the tower stairs answered the jolly fellow laughing then setting his lantern on the table that will teach you friend gideon to tie up your dogs you are foolishly weak over your dogs very foolishly those beasts of yours won't be satisfied till they have put us all out of doors just this minute i met blitzen in the long gallery he sprang at my leg see there are the marks of his teeth in proof of what i say and it is quite a new leg a brute of a hound tie up my dogs that's rather a new idea said the huntsman dogs tied up are good for nothing at all they grow too wild besides was not leverlay tied up after all see his broken cord what i tell you is not on my own account when they come near me i always hold up my stick and put my wooden leg foremost that is my discipline i say dogs in their kennels cats on the roof and the people in the castle tobias sat down after thus delivering himself of his sentiments and with both elbows on the table his eyes expanding with delight he confided to us that just now he was a bachelor you don't mean that yes marie anne is sitting up with gertrude in monseigneur's ante-room then you are in no hurry to go away no none at all i should like to stay in your company how unfortunate that you should have come in so late remarked sperver all the bottles are empty the disappointment of the discomfited major-domo excited my compassion the poor man would so gladly have enjoyed his widowhood but in spite of my endeavours to repress it a long yawn extended wide my mouth well another time said he rising what is only put off is not given up and he took his lantern good night gentlemen stop wait for me cried gideon i can see fritz is sleepy we will go down together very gladly sperver on our way we will have a word with trump the butler he is downstairs with the rest and knapwurst is telling them tales all right good night fritz good night gideon 
don't forget to send for me if the count is taken worse i will do as you wish Liberle, come they went out and as they were crossing the platform i could hear the night clock strike eleven i was tired out and soon fell asleep end of chapter three recording by james k white chula vista Chapter Four of the Man Wolf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Man Wolf by Emile Erkman and Alexandra Chatrian. Chapter Four. Daylight was beginning to tinge with bluish gray the only window in my dungeon tower when i was roused out of my niche in the granite by the prolonged distant notes of a hunting horn there is nothing more sad and melancholy than the wail of this instrument when the day begins to struggle with the night when not a sigh nor a sound besides comes to molest the solitary reign of silence it is especially the last long note which spreads in widening waves over the immensity of the plain beneath awakening the distant far-off echoes amongst the mountains that has in it a poetic element that stirs up the depths of the soul leaning upon my elbow in my bearskin i lay listening to the plaintive sound which suggested something of the feudal ages the contemplation of my chamber the ancient den of the wolf of nidic with its low dark arch threatening almost to come down to crush the occupant and further on that small leaden window just touching the ceiling more wide than high and deeply recessed in the wall added to the reality of the impression i arose quickly and ran to open the window wide then presented itself to my astonished eyes such a wondrous spectacle as no mortal tongue no pen of man can describe the wide prospect that the eagle the denizen of the high alps sweeps with his far-reaching kin every morning at the rising of the deep purple veil that overhung the horizon by night mountains farther off mountains far away and yet again in the blue distance mountains still blending with the gray mists of the morning in the shadowy horizon motionless billows that sink into peace and stillness in the blue distance of the plains of laurent such is a faint idea of the mighty scenery of the Vouja boundless forests silver lakes dazzling crests ridges and peaks projecting their clear outlines upon the steel blue of the valleys clothed in snow beyond this infinite space could any enthusiasm of poet or skill of painter attain the sublime elevation of such a scene as that i stood mute in admiration at every moment the details stood out more clearly in the advancing light of morning hamlets farmhouses villages seemed to rise and peep out of every undulation of the land a little more attention brought more and more numerous objects into view i had leaned out of my window wrapped in contemplation for more than a quarter of an hour when a hand was laid lightly upon my shoulder i turned round startled when the calm figure and quiet smile of gideon saluted me with guten tag fritz good morning then he also rested his arms on the window smoking his short pipe he extended his hand and said look fritz and admire you are a son of the black forest and you must admire all that look there below there is roche cruz do you see it don't you remember gertrude how far off those times seem now sperver brushed away a tear what could i say we sat long contemplating and meditating over this grand spectacle from time to time the old poacher noticing me with my eyes fixed upon some distant object would explain that is the waldhorn this is the tiefenthal there's the fall of the steinbach it has stopped running now it is hanging down in great fringed sheets like the curtains over the shoulder of the harburg a cold winter's cloak 
down there is a path that leads to freeborg in a fortnight's time it will be difficult to trace it thus our time passed away i could not tear myself away from so beautiful a prospect a few birds of prey with wings hollowed into a graceful curve sharp pointed at each end the fan-shaped tail spread out were silently sweeping round the rock-hewn tower herons flew unscathed above them owing their safety from the grasp of the sharp claws and the tearing beak to the elevation of their flight not a cloud marred the beauty of the blue sky all the snow had fallen to earth once more the huntsman's horn awoke the echoes that is my friend sebalt lamenting down there said sperver he knows everything about horses and dogs and he sounds the hunter's horn better than any man in germany listen fritz how soft and mellow the notes are poor sebalt he is pining away over monseigneur's illness he cannot hunt as he used to do his only comfort is to get up every morning at sunrise on to the altenburg and play the count's favorite airs he thinks he shall be able to cure him that way sperver with the good taste of a man who appreciates beautiful scenery had offered no interruption to my contemplations but when my eyes dazzled and swimming with so much light i turned round to the darkness of the tower he said to me fritz it's all right the count has had no fresh attack these words brought me back to a sense of the realities of life ah i am very glad it is all owing to you fritz what do you mean i have not prescribed yet what signifies you were there that was enough you are only joking gideon what is the use of my being present if i don't prescribe why you bring him good luck i looked straight at him but he was not even smiling yes fritz you are just a messenger of good the last two years the lord had another attack the next day after the first then a third and a fourth you have put an end to that what can be clearer well to me it is not so very clear on the contrary it is very obscure we are never too old to learn the good man went on fritz there are messengers of evil and there are messengers of good now that rascal knapwurst he is a sure messenger of ill if ever i meet him as i am going out hunting i am sure of some misadventure my gun misses fire or i sprain my ankle or a dog gets ripped up all sorts of mischief come so being quite aware of this i always try and set off at early daybreak before that author of mischief who sleeps like a dormouse has opened his eyes or else i slip out by a back way by the postern gate don't you see i understand you very well but your ideas seem to me very strange gideon you fritz he went on without noticing my interruption you are a most excellent lad heaven has covered your head with innumerable blessings just one glance at your jolly countenance your frank clear eyes your good-natured smile is enough to make anyone happy you positively bring good luck with you i have always said so and now would you like to have a proof yes indeed i should it would be worth while to know how much there is in me without my having any knowledge of it well said he grasping my wrist look down there he pointed to a hillock at a couple of gunshots from the castle do you see there a rock half buried in the snow with a ragged bush by its side quite well do you see anything near no well there is a reason for that you have driven away the black plague every year at the second attack there she was holding her feet between her hands by night she lighted a fire she warmed herself and boiled roots she bore a curse with her this morning the very first thing which i did was to get up here i climbed up the beacon tower i looked well all round the old hag was nowhere to be seen i shaded my eyes with my hand i looked up and down right and left and everywhere 
not a sign of the creature anywhere she had scented you evidently and the good fellow in a fit of enthusiasm shook me warmly by the hand crying with unchecked emotion ah fritz how glad i am that i brought you here the witch will be sold eh well i confess i felt a little ashamed that i had been all my life such a very well-deserving young man without knowing anything of the circumstance myself so sperver i said the count has spent a good night a very good one then i am very well pleased let us go down we again traversed the high parapet and i was now better able to examine this way of access the ramparts of which arose from a prodigious depth and they were extended along the sharp narrow ridge of the rock down to the very bottom of the valley it was a long flight of jagged precipitous steps descending from the wolf's den or rather eagle's nest down to the deep valley below gazing down i felt giddy and recoiling in alarm to the middle of the platform i hastily descended down the path which led to the main building we had already traversed several great corridors when a great open door stood before us i looked in and descried at the top of a double ladder the little gnome knapwurst whose strange appearance had struck me the night before the hall itself attracted my attention by its imposing aspect it was the receptacle of the archives of the house of nidic a high dark dusty apartment with long gothic windows reaching from the angle of the ceiling to within a couple of yards from the floor there were collected along spacious shelves by the care of the old abbots not only all the documents title deeds and family genealogies of the house of nidic establishing their rights and their alliances and connections with all the great historic families of germany but besides these there were all the chronicles of the black forest the collected works of the old menesinger and great folio volumes from the presses of gutenberg and faust entitled to equal veneration on account of their remarkable history and of the enduring solidity of their binding the deep shadows of the groined vaults their arches divided by massive ribs and descending partly down the cold gray walls reminded one of the gloomy cloisters of the middle ages and amidst these characteristic surroundings sat an ugly dwarf on the top of his ladder with a red-edged volume upon his bonny knees his head half buried in a rough fur cap small gray eyes wide misshapen mouth humps on back and shoulders a most uninviting object the familiar spirit the rat as sperver would have it of this last refuge of all the learning belonging to the princely race of nidic but a truly historical importance belonged to this chamber in the long series of family portraits filling almost entirely one side of the ancient library all were there men and women from hugh the wolf to yeri hans the present owner from the first rough daub of barbarous times to the perfect work of the best modern painters my attention was naturally drawn in that direction hugh the first a bald-headed figure seemed to glare upon you like a wolf stealing upon you round the corner of a wood his gray bloodshot eyes his red beard and his large hairy ears gave him a fearful and ferocious aspect next to him like the lamb next to the wolf was the portrait of a lady of youthful years with gentle blue eyes hands crossed on the breast over a book of devotions and tresses of fair long silky hair encircling her sweet countenance with a glorious golden aureola this picture struck me by its wonderful resemblance to odile of nidic i have never seen anything more lovely and more charming than this old painting on wood which was stiff enough indeed in its outline but delightfully refreshing and ingenious i had examined this picture attentively for some minutes when another female portrait hanging at its side drew my attention reluctantly away here was a woman of the true visigoth type with a wide low forehead yellowish eyes prominent cheekbones red hair and a nose hooked like an eagle's beak that woman must have been an excellent match for hugh thought i 
and i began to consider the costume which answered perfectly to the energy displayed in the head for the right hand rested upon a sword and an iron breastplate enclosed the figure i should have some difficulty in expressing the thoughts which passed through my mind in the examination of these three portraits my eye passed from the one to the other with singular curiosity sperver standing at the library door had aroused the attention of knapwurst with a sharp whistle which made that worthy send a glance in his direction though it did not succeed in fetching him down from his elevation is it me that you're whistling to like a dog said the dwarf i am you vermin it is an honor you don't deserve just listen to me sperver replied the little man with sublime scorn you cannot spit so high as my shoe which he contemptuously held out suppose i were to come up if you come up a single step i'll squash you flat with this volume gideon laughed and replied don't get angry friend i don't mean to do you any harm on the contrary i greatly respect you for your learning but what i want to know is what you were doing here so early in the morning by lamplight you look as if you had spent the night here so i have i have been reading all night are not the days long enough for you to read in no i am following out an important inquiry and i don't mean to sleep until i am satisfied indeed and what may this very important question be i have to ascertain under what circumstances ludwig of nideck discovered my ancestor otto the dwarf in the forests of thuringia you know sperver that my ancestor otto was only a cubit high that is a foot and a half he delighted the world with his wisdom and made an honorable figure at the coronation of duke rudolph count ludwig had him enclosed in a cold roast peacock served up in all his plumage it was at that time one of the greatest delicacies served up garnished all round with suckling pigs gilded and silvered during the banquet otto kept spreading the peacock's tail and all the lords courtiers and ladies of high birth were astonished and delighted at this wonderful piece of mechanism at last he came out sword in hand and shouted with a loud voice long live duke rudolph and the cry was repeated with acclamations by the whole table bernard herzog makes mention of this event but he has neglected to inform us where this dwarf came from whether he was of lofty lineage or of base extraction which latter however is very improbable for the lower sort of people have not so much sense as that i was astounded at so much pride in so diminutive a being yet my curiosity prevented me from showing too much of my feelings for he alone could supply me with information upon the portraits that accompanied that of hugh lupus monsieur knapwurst i began very respectfully would you oblige me by enlightening me upon certain historic doubts speak sir without any constraint on the subject of family history and chronicles i am entirely at your service other matters don't interest me i desire to learn some particulars respecting the two portraits on each side of the founder of this race aha uh -huh, cried knapwurst with a glow of satisfaction lighting up his hideous features you mean hedviga and huldina the two wives of hugh lupus and laying down his volume he descended from his ladder to speak more at his ease his eyes glistened and the delight of gratified vanity beamed from them as he displayed his vast erudition when he had arrived at my side he bowed to me with ceremonious gravity sperver stood behind us very well satisfied that i was admiring the dwarf of nideck in spite of the ill luck which in his opinion accompanied the little monster's appearance he respected and boasted of his superior knowledge sir said knapwurst pointing with his yellow hand to the portraits hugh of nideck the first of his illustrious race married in eight thirty two hedviga of lutzelborg who brought to him in dowry the counties of Giramani and haute bar the castles of geraldsek teufelshorn and others hugh lupus had no issue by his first wife who died young in the year of our lord eight thirty seven then hugh having become lord and owner of the dowry refused to give it up 
and there were terrible battles between himself and his brothers-in-law but his second wife huldina whom you see there in a steel breastplate aided him by her sage counsel it is unknown whence or of what family she came but for all that she saved hugh's life who had been made prisoner by franz of lutzelburg he was to have been hanged that very day and a gibbet had already been set up on the ramparts when huldina at the head of her husband's vassals whom she had armed and inspired with her own courage bravely broke in released hugh and hung franz in his place hugh had married his wife in eight forty two and had three children by her so i resumed pensively the first of these wives was called hedviga and the descendants of nidic are not related to her not at all are you quite sure i can show you our genealogical tree hedviga had no children huldina the second wife had three that is surprising to me why so i thought i traced a resemblance ha <laughs> ha resemblance rubbish cried knapwurst with a discordant laugh see look at this wooden snuff-box in it you see a portrait of my great-grandfather hansvurst his nose is as long and as pointed as an extinguisher and his jaws like nutcrackers how does that affect his being the grandfather of me of a man with finely formed features and an agreeable mouth oh no of course not well so it is with the nidics they may some of them be like hedviga but for all that huldina is the head of their ancestry see the genealogical tree now sir are you satisfied then we separated knapwurst and i excellent friends end of chapter four recording by james k white chula vista chapter five of the man wolf this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by james k white chula vista the man wolf by emile erkman and alexandra chatrian chapter five nevertheless thought i there is the likeness it is not chance what is chance there is no such thing it is nonsense to talk of chance it must be something higher i was following my friend sperver deep in thought who had now resumed his walk down the corridor the portrait of hedviga in all its artless simplicity mingled in my mind with the face of odile suddenly gideon stopped and raising my eyes i saw that we were standing before the count's door come in fritz he said and i will give the dogs a feed when the master is away the servants neglect their duty i will come for you by and by i entered more desirous of seeing the young lady than the count her father i was blaming myself for my remissness but there is no controlling one's interest in affections i was much surprised to see in the half-light of the alcove the reclining figure of the count leaning upon his elbow and observing me with profound attention i was so little prepared for this examination that i stood rather dispossessed of self-command come nearer monsieur le docteur he said in a weak but firm voice holding out his hand my faithful sperver has often mentioned your name to me and i was anxious to make your acquaintance let us hope my lord that it will be continued under more favourable circumstances a little patience and we shall avert this attack i think not he replied i feel my time drawing near you are mistaken my lord no nature grants us as a last favour to have a presentiment of our approaching end how often i have seen such presentiments falsified i said with a smile he fixed his eyes searchingly upon me as is usual with patients expressing anxiety about their prospects it is a difficult moment for the doctor the moral strength of his patient 
depends upon the expression of the firmness of his convictions the eye of the sufferer penetrates into the innermost soul of his consciousness if he believes that he can discover any hint or shade of doubt his fate is sealed depression sets in the secret springs that maintain the elasticity of the spirit give way and the disorder has it all its own way i stood my examination firmly and successfully and the count seemed to regain confidence he again pressed my hand and resigned himself calmly and confidently to my treatment not until then did i perceive mademoiselle odile and an old lady no doubt her governess seated by her bedside at the other end of the alcove they silently saluted me and suddenly the picture in the library reappeared before me it is she i said hugh's first wife there is the fair and noble brow there are the long lashes and that sad unfathomable smile oh how much past telling lies in a woman's smile seek not then for unmixed joy and pleasure her smile serves but to veil untold sorrows anxiety for the future even heart-rending cares the maid the wife the mother smile and smile even when the heart is breaking and the abyss is opening o oh, woman this is thy part in the mortal struggle of human life i was pursuing these reflections when the lord of nidic began to speak if my dear child odile would but consult my wishes i believe my health would return i looked towards the young countess she fixed her eyes on the floor and seemed to be praying silently yes the sick man went on i should then return to life the prospect of seeing myself surrounded by a young family and of pressing grandchildren to my heart and beholding the succession to my house would revive me at the mild and gentle tone of entreaty in which this was said i felt deeply moved with compassion but the young lady made no reply in a minute or two the count who kept his watchful eyes upon her went on odile you refuse to make your father a happy man i only ask for a faint hope i fix no time i won't limit your choice we will go to court there you will have a hundred opportunities of marrying with distinction and with honor who would not be proud to win my daughter's hand you shall be perfectly free to decide for yourself he paused there is nothing more painful to a stranger than these family quarrels there are such contending interests so many private motives at work that mere modesty should make it our duty to place ourselves out of hearing of such discussions i felt pained and would gladly have retired but the circumstances of the case forbade this my dear father said odile as if to evade any further discussion you will get better heaven will not take you from those who love you if you but knew the fervor with which i pray for you that is not an answer said the count dryly what objection can you make to my proposal is it not fair and natural am i to be deprived of the consolations vouchsafed to the neediest and most wretched you know i have acted towards you openly and frankly you have my father then give me your reason for your refusal my resolution is formed i have consecrated myself to god so much firmness in so frail a being made me tremble she stood like the sculptured madonna in hugh's tower calm and immovable however weak in appearance the eyes of the count kindled with ominous fire i tried to make the young countess understand by signs how gladly i would hear her give the least hope and calm his rising passion but she seemed not to see me so he cried in a smothered tone as if he were strangling so you will look on and see your father perish a word would restore him to life and you refuse to speak that one word 
life is not in the hand of man for it is god's gift my word can be of no avail those are nothing but pious maxims answered the count scornfully to release you from your plain duty but has not god said honor thy father and thy mother i do honor you she replied gently but it is my duty not to marry i could hear the grinding and gnashing of the man's teeth he lay apparently calm but presently turned abruptly and cried leave me the sight of you is offensive to me and addressing me as i stood by agitated with conflicting feelings doctor he cried with a savage grin have you any violent malignant poison about you to give me something that will destroy me like a thunderbolt it would be a mercy to poison me like a dog rather than let me suffer as i am doing his features writhed convulsively his color became livid odile rose and advanced to the door stay he howled furiously stay till i have cursed you so far i had stood by without speaking not venturing to interfere between father and daughter but now i could refrain no longer monseigneur i cried for the sake of your own health for the sake of mere justice and fairness do calm yourself your life is at stake what matters my life what matters the future is there a knife here to put an end to me let me die his excitement rose every minute i seemed to dread lest in some frenzied moment he should spring from the bed and destroy his child's life but she calm though deadly pale knelt at the door which was standing open and outside i could see sperver whose features betrayed the deepest anxiety he drew near without noise and bending towards odile oh mademoiselle he whispered mademoiselle the count is such a worthy good man if you would but just say only perhaps by and by we will see she made no reply and did not change her attitude at this moment i persuaded the lord of nidic to take a few drops of laudanum he sank back with a sigh and soon his panting and irregular breathing became more measured under the influence of a deep and heavy slumber odile arose and her aged friend who had not opened her lips went out with her sperver and i watched their slowly retreating figures there was a calm grandeur in the step of the young countess which seemed to express a consciousness of duty fulfilled when she had disappeared down the long corridor gideon turned towards me well fritz he said gravely what is your opinion i bent my head down without answering this girl's incredible firmness astonished and bewildered me end of chapter five recording by james k white chula vista Chapter Six of the Man Wolf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Man Wolf by Emile Erkman and Alexandra Chatrian. Chapter Six. Sperver's indignation was mounting. There's the happiness and felicity of the rich. What is the good of being master of Nidic, with castles, forests, lakes, and all the best parts of the Black Forest, when an innocent-looking damsel comes and says to you in her sweet, soft voice, Is that your will? Well, it is not mine. Do you say I must? Well, I say no, I won't. Is it not awful? Would it not be better to be a woodcutter's son and live quietly upon the wages of your day's work? come on fritz let us be off i am suffocating here i want to get into the open air and the good fellow seizing my arm dragged me down the corridor it was now about nine the sky had been fair when we got up but now the clouds had again covered the dreary earth the north wind was raising the snow in ghostly eddies against the window panes and i could scarcely distinguish the summits of the neighboring mountains 
we were going down the stairs which led into the hall when at a turn in the corridor we found ourselves face to face with tobias offenlock the worthy major-domo in a great state of palpitation hello he cried closing our way with his stick right across the passage where are you off to in such a hurry what about our breakfast breakfast which breakfast do you mean asked sperver what do you mean by pretending to forget what breakfast are not you and i to breakfast this morning with dr fritz aha uh -huh, so we are i had forgotten all about it and offenlock burst into a great laugh which divided his jolly face from ear to ear ha <laughs> ha this is rather beyond a joke and i was afraid of being too late come let us be moving casper is upstairs waiting i ordered him to lay the breakfast in your room i thought we should be more comfortable there good-bye for the present doctor are you not coming up with us asked sperver no i'm going to tell the countess that the baron de zimmer bluderich begs the honor to thank her in person before he leaves the castle the baron de zimmer yes that stranger who came yesterday in the middle of the night well you must make haste yes i shall not be long before you have done uncorking the bottles i shall be with you again and he hobbled away as fast as he could the mention of breakfast had given a different turn to sperver's thoughts exactly so he observed turning back the best way to drown all your cares is to drink a draught of good wine i am very glad we are going to breakfast in my room under those great high vaults in the fencing school sitting round a small table you feel just like mice nibbling a nut in a corner of a big church here we are fritz just listen to the wind whistling through the arrow slits in half an hour there will be a storm he pushed the door open and casper who was only drumming with his fingers upon the window panes seemed very glad to see us that little man had flaxen hair and a snub nose sperver had made him his factotum it was he who took to pieces and cleaned his guns mended the riding horse's harness fed the dogs in his absence and superintended in the kitchen the preparation of his favorite dishes on grand occasions he was outrider he now stood with a napkin over his arm and was gravely uncorking the long-necked bottle of rhenish casper said his master as soon as he had surveyed this satisfactory state of things casper i was very well pleased with you yesterday everything was excellent the roast kid the chicken and the fish i like fair play and when a man has done his duty i like to tell him so Today i am quite as well satisfied the boar's head looks excellent with its white wine sauce so does the crayfish soup isn't it your opinion too fritz i assented well said sperver since it is so you shall have the honor of filling our glasses i mean to raise you step by step for you are a very deserving fellow casper looked down bashfully and blushed he seemed to enjoy his master's praises we took our places and i was wondering at this quondam poacher who in years gone by was content to cook his own potatoes in his cottage now assuming all the airs of a great seigneur had he been born lord of nidick he could not have put on a more noble and dignified attitude at table a single glance brought casper to his side made him bring such and such a bottle or bring the dish he required we were just going to attack the boar's head when master tobias appeared in person followed by no less a personage than the baron of zimmer bluderich attended by his groom we rose from our seats the young baron advanced to meet us with head uncovered it was a noble-looking head pale and haughty with a surrounding of fine dark hair he stopped before sperver monsieur said he in that pure saxon accent which no other dialect can approach i am come to ask you for information as to this locality madame la comtesse de nidic tells me that no one knows these mountains so well as yourself that is quite true monseigneur and i am quite at your service circumstances of great urgency oblige me to start in the midst of the storm replied the baron pointing to the window panes thickly covered with flakes of snow i must reach waldhorn six leagues from this place 
that will be a hard matter my lord for all the roads are blocked up with snow i am aware of that but necessity obliges you must have a guide then i will go if you will allow me to subalt craft the head huntsman at nidick he knows the mountains almost as well as i do i am much obliged to you for your kind offers and i am very grateful but still i cannot accept them your instructions will be quite sufficient sperver bowed then advancing to a window he opened it wide a furious blast of wind rushed in driving the whirling snow as far as the corridor and slammed the door with a crash i remained by my chair leaning on its back casper slunk into a corner sperver and the baron with his groom stood at the open window gentlemen said sperver with a loud voice to make himself heard above the howling winds and with arm extended you see the country mapped out before you if the weather was fair i would take you up into the tower and then we could see the whole of the black forest at our feet but it is no use now here you can see the peak of the altenberg farther on behind that white ridge you may see the waldhorn beaten by a furious storm you must make straight for the waldhorn from the summit of the rock which seems formed like a mitre and is called roche you will see three peaks the Berenkop, the gerestein and the trifles it is by this last one at the right that you must proceed there is a torrent across the valley of the rathal but it must be frozen now in any case if you can get no farther you will find on your left on following the bank a cavern halfway up the hill called roche cruz you can spend the night there and tomorrow very likely if the wind falls you will see the waldhorn before you if you are lucky enough to meet with a charcoal burner he might perhaps show you where there is a ford over the stream but i doubt whether one will be found anywhere on such a day as this there are none from our neighborhood only be careful to go right round the base of the baron cop for you could not get down the other side it is a precipice during these observations i was watching sperver whose clear energetic tones indicated the different points in the road with the greatest precision and i watched too the young baron who was listening with the closest attention no obstacle seemed to alarm him the old groom seemed not less bent upon the enterprise just as they were leaving the window a momentary light broke through the gray snow clouds just one of those moments when the eddying wind lays hold of the falling clouds of snow and flings them back again like floating garments of white then for a moment there was a glimpse of the distance the three peaks stood out behind the altenberg the description which sperver had given of invisible objects became visible for a few moments then the air again was veiled in ghostly clouds of flying snow thank you said the baron now i have seen the point i am to make for and thanks to your explanations i hope to reach it sperver bowed without answering the young man and his servant having saluted us retired slowly and gravely gideon shut the window and addressing master tobias and me said the deuce must be in the man to start off in such horrible weather as this i could hardly turn out a wolf on such a day as this however it is their business not mine i seem to remember that young man's face and his servants too now let us drink mater toby your health i had gone to the window and as the baron zimmer and his groom mounted on horseback in the middle of the courtyard in spite of the snow which was filling the air i saw at the left in a turret pierced with long gothic windows the pale countenance of odile directed long and anxiously towards the young man hello fritz what are you doing i'm only looking at those strangers horses oh the wallachians i saw them this morning in the stable they are splendid animals the horseman galloped away at full speed and the curtain in the turret window dropped End of chapter 6 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Chapter 7 of The Man-Wolf This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Man Wolf by Emile Erkman and Alexandre Chatrion. Chapter 7 Several uneventful days followed. My life at Nidic was becoming dull and monotonous. Every morning there was the doleful bugle call of the huntsman, whose occupation was gone. Then came a visit to the count. After that, breakfast, with Sperber's interminable speculations upon the Black Plague, the incessant gossiping and chattering of Marie Lagoutte, Maitre Tobias, and all that pack of idle servants who had nothing to do but eat and drink, smoke and go to sleep. The only man who had any kind of individual existence was Knapwurst, who sat buried up to the tip of his red nose in old chronicles all the day long, careless of the cold, so long as there was anything left to find out in his curious researches. My weariness of all this may easily be imagined. Ten times had Sperver taken me over the stables and the kennels. The dogs were beginning to know me. I knew by heart all the coarse pleasantries of the major domo over his bottles and Marie Lagoutte's invariable replies. Sibalt's melancholy was infecting me. I would gladly have blown a little on his horn to tell the mountains of my ennui, and my eyes were incessantly directed towards Fribourg. Still, the disorder of Yeri Hans, Lord of Nidic, was taking its usual course, and this gave my only occupation any serious interest. All the particulars which Sperver had made me acquainted with appeared clearly before me. Sometimes the Count, waking up with a start, would half rise and, supported on his elbow, with neck outstretched and haggard eyes, would mutter, She is coming! She is coming! Then Gideon would shake his head and ascend the signal tower. But neither right nor left could the Black Plague be discovered. After long reflection upon this strange malady, I had come to the conclusion that the sufferer was insane. The strange influence that the old hag exercised over him, his alternate phases of madness and lucidity, all confirmed me in this view. Medical men who have given especial attention to the subject of mental aberrations are well aware that periodical madness is of not unfrequent occurrence. In some cases the illness appears several times in the year, in others at only particular seasons of the year. I know at Fribourg an old lady, who for thirty years past has regularly presented herself at the door of the asylum. At her own request they place her in confinement. Then the unhappy woman every night passes through the terrible scenes of the French Revolution, of which she was a witness in her youth. She trembles in the hands of the executioner. She fancies herself drenched with the blood of the victims. She weeps and cries aloud incessantly. In the course of a few weeks, the mind returns to its wonted seat, and she is restored to liberty with the full expectation that she will return again in a year. The Count of Nidic is suffering from a similar attack, I said. Unknown chains unite his fate with that of the Black Plague. Who can tell, thought I, that woman once was young, perhaps beautiful, and my imagination once launched carried me into the interesting regions of romance, but I was careful to tell no one what I thought. If I had opened out those conjectures to Sperver, he would never have forgiven me for imagining that there could have been any intimacy between his master and the Black Plague, and as for Mademoiselle Odile, I dared not suggest insanity to her. The poor young lady was evidently most unhappy. Her refusal to marry had so embittered the Count against her that he could scarcely endure to have her in his presence. He bitterly reproached her with her ingratitude and disobedience, and expatiated upon the cruelty of ungrateful children. Sometimes even violent curses followed his daughter's visits. Things at last were so bad that I thought myself obliged to interfere. I therefore waited one evening on the countess in the antechamber, and entreated her to relinquish her personal attendance upon her father, 
but here arose contrary to all expectations quite an unforeseen obstacle in spite of all my entreaties she steadily insisted on watching by her father and nursing him as she had done hitherto it is my duty she repeated and no arguments will shake my purpose she said firmly madam i replied as a last effort the medical profession too has its duties and an honorable man must fulfill them even to harshness and cruelty your presence is killing your father i shall remember all my life the sudden change in the expression of the face of odile my solemn words of warning seemed to cause the blood to flow back to the heart her face became white as marble and her large blue eyes fixed steadily upon mine seemed to read into the most secret recesses of my soul is that possible sir she stammered upon your honor do you declare this tell me truly yes madam upon my honor there was a long and painful silence only broken at last by these words in a low voice let god's will be done and with downcast eyes she withdrew the day after this scene about eight in the morning i was pacing up and down in hugh lupus's tower thinking of the count's illness of which i could not foretell the issue and i was thinking too of my patients at fribourg whom i might lose by too prolonged an absence when three discreet taps upon my door turned my thoughts into another channel come in the door opened and marie lagoutte stood within dropping me a low curtsy this old dame's visit put me out and i was going to beg her to postpone her visit when something mysterious in her countenance caught my attention she had thrown over her shoulders a red and green shawl she was biting her lips with her head down and as soon as she had closed the door she opened it again and peeped out to make sure that no one had followed her what does she want with me i thought what is the meaning of all these precautions and i was quite puzzled monsieur le docteur said the worthy lady advancing towards me i beg your pardon for disturbing you so early in the morning but i have a very serious thing to tell you pray tell me all about it then it is the count indeed yes sir you know that i sat up with him last night i know pray sit down she sat before me in a great armchair and i could not help noticing the energetic character of her head which on the evening of my arrival at the castle had only seemed to me grotesque doctor she resumed after a short pause and with her dark eyes upon me you know i am not timid or easily frightened i have seen so many dreadful things in the course of my life that i am astonished at nothing now when you have seen marengo austerlitz and moscow there is nothing left that can put you out i am sure of that ma'am i don't want to boast that is not my reason for telling you this but it is to show you that i am not an escaped lunatic and that you may believe me when i tell you what i say i have seen this was becoming interesting well the good woman resumed last night between nine and ten just as i was going to bed offenloch came in and said to me marie you will have to sit up with the count tonight at first i felt surprised what is not mademoiselle going to sit up no mademoiselle is poorly and you will have to take her place poor girl she is ill i knew that would be the end of it i told her so a hundred times but it is always so young people won't believe those who are older and then it is her father so i took my knitting said good night to tobias and went into monseigneur's room sperver was there waiting for me and went to bed so there i was all alone here the good woman stopped a moment indulged in a pinch of snuff and tried to arrange her thoughts i listened with eager attention for what was coming about half-past ten she went on i was sitting near the bed 
and from time to time drew the curtain to see what the count was doing he made no movement he was sleeping as quietly as a child it was all right until eleven o'clock then i began to feel tired an old woman sir cannot help herself she must drop off to sleep in spite of everything i did not think anything was going to happen and i said to myself he is sure to sleep till daylight about twelve the wind went down the big windows had been rattling but now they were quiet i got up to see if anything was stirring outside it was all as black as ink so i came back to my armchair i took another look at the patient i saw that he had not stirred an inch and i took up my knitting but in a few minutes more i began nodding nodding and i dropped right off to sleep i could not help it the armchair was so soft and the room was so warm who could have helped it i had been asleep an hour i suppose when a sharp current of wind woke me up i opened my eyes and what do you think i saw the tall middle window was wide open the curtains were drawn and there in the opening stood the count in his white nightdress right on the window sill the count yes nay it is impossible he cannot move so i thought too but that is just how i saw him he was standing with a torch in his hand the night was so dark and the air so still that the flame stood up quite straight i gazed upon marie anne with astonishment first of all she said after a moment's silence to see that long thin man standing there with his bare legs i can assure you it had such an effect upon me i wanted to scream but then i thought perhaps he is walking in his sleep if i shout he will wake up he will jump down and then so i did not say a word but i stared and stared till i saw him lift up his torch in the air over his head then he lowered it then up again and down again and he did this three times just like a man making signals then he threw it down upon the ramparts shut the window drew the curtains passed before me without speaking and got into bed muttering some words i could not make out are you sure you saw all that ma'am quite sure well it is strange i know it is but it is true ah it did astonish me at first and then when i saw him get into bed again and cross his hands over his breast just as if nothing had happened i said to myself marie anne you have had a bad dream it cannot be true and so i went to the window and there i saw the torch still burning it had fallen into a bush near the third gate and there it was shining just like a spark of fire there was no denying it marie lagoutte looked at me a few moments without speaking you may be sure doctor that after that i had no more sleep i sat watching and ready for anything every moment i fancied i could hear something behind the armchair i was not afraid it was not that but i was uneasy and restless when morning came very early i ran and woke offenlock and sent him to the count passing down the corridor i noticed that there was no torch in the first ring and i came down and found it near the narrow path to the schwarzwald there it is and the good woman took from under her apron the end of a torch which she threw upon the table i was confounded how had that man whom i had seen the night before feeble and exhausted been able to rise walk lift up and close down that heavy window what was the meaning of that signal by night i seemed to myself to witness this strange mysterious scene and my thoughts went off at once to the black plague when i aroused myself from this contemplation of my own thoughts i saw marie lagoutte rising and preparing to go you have done quite right i said as i took her to the door to tell me of these things and i am much obliged to you have you told anyone else of this adventure no one sir such things are only to be told to the priest and the doctor 
come i see you are a very wise sensible woman these words were exchanged at the door of my tower at this moment sperver appeared at the end of the gallery followed by his friend sebalt fritz he shouted i have got news to tell you oh come thought i more news this is a strange condition of things marie lagoutte had disappeared and the huntsman and his friend entered the tower end of chapter seven recording by james k white chula vista chapter eight of the man wolf this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by james k white chula vista the man wolf by emile erkman and alexandre chatrion chapter eight on the countenance of sperver was an expression of suppressed wrath on that of his companion bitter irony this worthy sportsman whose woeful physiognomy had struck me on my first arrival at nideck was as thin and dry as a lath his hunting jacket was girded tightly about him by his belt from which hung a hunting knife with a horn handle long leathern gaiters came above his knees the horn went over his shoulder from right to left the wide expanded opening under his arm on his head a wide-brimmed hat with a heron's plume in the buckle his profile coming to a point in a reddish tuft looked not unlike a goat's yes cried sperver i have got strange things to tell you he threw himself in a chair seizing his head between his clenched hands while dismal sebalt calmly drew his horn over his head and laid it on the table now sebalt cried gideon speak out the witch is hanging about the castle this piece of intelligence would have failed to interest me before seeing marie lagoutte but now it struck more forcibly there certainly was some mysterious connection between the lord of nideck and that old woman i knew nothing of the nature of this connection and i felt that at whatever cost i must know it just wait a moment friends said i to sperver and his comrade i want to know first of all where does this black pest come from sperver stared at me with astonishment come from who can tell that very well you can't but when does she come within sight of nideck as i told you ten days before christmas at the same time every year and how long does she stay a fortnight or three weeks is she ever seen before not even on her way nor after no then we shall have to catch her seize upon her i cried this is contrary to nature we must find out where she comes from what she wants here what she is lay hold of her exclaimed sperver seize her do you mean it and he shook his head fritz your advice is good enough in its way but it is easier said than done i could very easily send a bullet after her almost at any time but the count won't consent to that measure and as for catching in any other way than by powder and shot why you had better go first and catch a squirrel by the tail listen to sebalt's story and you shall judge for yourself the master of the hounds sitting on the table with his long legs crossed fixed his eyes mournfully upon me and began his tale this morning as i was coming down from the altenburg i followed the hollow road to nideck the snow filled it up entirely i was going on my way thinking of nothing particular when i noticed a foot track it was deep down and went across the road the person had come down the bank and gone up on the other side it was not a soft hare's foot which hardly leaves an impression it was not forked like a wild boar's track it was not like a cloven hoof such as the wolf's it was a deep hole i stopped and stooped down and cleared away the loose snow that fell round and came upon the very track of the black pest are you sure it was that of course i am i know the old woman by her foot better than by her figure 
for I always go, sir, with my eyes on the ground. I know everybody by their tracks, and as for this one, a child might know it. What then distinguishes this foot so particularly? It is so small that you could cover it with your hand. It is finely shaped. The heel is rather long, the outline clean, the great toe lies close to the other toes, and they are all as fine as if they were in a lady's slipper. It is a lovely foot. Twenty years ago I should have fallen in love with a foot like that. Whenever I come across it, it has such an effect upon me. No one could believe that such a foot could belong to the Black Plague. And the poor fellow, joining his hands together, contemplated the stone floor with doleful eyes. Well, Sebald, what next? asked Sperver impatiently. Ah, uh, yes, to be sure. Well, I recognized that track and started off in pursuit. I was hoping to catch the creature in her lair, but I will tell you the way she took me. I climbed up the bank by the roadside only two gunshots from Nidick. I go along the hill, keeping the track on my right. It led along the side of the wood in the Rathal. All at once it jumps over the ditch into the wood. I stuck to it, but happening to look a little to my left I saw another track which had been following the Black Plague. I stopped short. Was it Sperver's, or Caspar Trump's, or whose? I came to it, and you may fancy how astounded I was when I saw that it was nobody from our place. I know every foot in the Schwarzwald, from Freiburg to Nidick. That foot was like none of ours. It must have come from a distance. The boot, for it was a kind of well-made soft gentleman's boot, with spurs which leave a little print behind them, the boot was not round at the toes, but square. The sole was thin, and bent with every step, and it had no nails in it. The walk was rapid and the short steps were like those of a young man of twenty to five and twenty. I noticed the stitches in the side leather at once, and I think I never saw finer. Who can this be? Sperver exclaimed. Sebalt raised his shoulders and extended his hands, but said nothing. Who can have any object in following the old woman? I asked Sperver. No one on earth can tell, was the reply. And so we sat a few minutes, meditating over what we had heard. At last he went on again with his narrative. I kept following the track. It went up the next ridge through the pine forest. When it doubled round the Rochefendu, I said to myself, Ah, you accursed plague! If there was much game of your sort, there would not be much sport. It would be preferable to work like a nigger. So we all three arrive, the two tracks and I, at the top of the Schneeberg. There the wind had been blowing hard. The snow was knee-deep. But no matter. I must get on. I got to the edge of the torrent of the Steinbach, and there I lost the track. I halted, and I saw that after trying up and down in several directions, the gentleman's boots had gone down the Tiefenbach. That was a bad sign. I looked along the other side of the torrent, but there was no appearance of a track there none at all. The old hag had paddled up and down the stream to throw anyone off the scent who should try to follow her. Where was I to go to? Right? Or left? Or straight on? Not knowing, I came back to Nidick. You haven't told us about her breakfast, said Sperver. No, I was forgetting. At the foot of Rochefendu I saw there had been a fire. There was a black place. I laid my hand upon it, thinking it might be warm, which would have proved that the Black Plague had not gone far, but it was as cold as ice. Close by I saw a wire trap in the bushes. It seems the creature knows how to snare game. A hare had been caught in it. The print of its body was still plain, lying flat in the snow. The witch had lighted the fire to cook it. She had had a good breakfast, I'll be bound. At this... Sperver cried indignantly. Just fancy that old witch living on meat while so many honest folks in our villages have nothing better than potatoes to eat. That's what upsets me, Fritz. Ah, if I had but... But his thoughts remained untold. He turned deadly pale, and all three of us, in a moment, stood rigid and motionless, staring with horror 
at each other's ghastly countenances a yell the howling cry of the wolf in the long cold days of winter the cry which none can imagine who has not heard the most fearful and harrowing of all bestial sounds that fearful cry was echoing through the castle not far from us it rose up the spiral staircase it filled the massive building as if the hungry savage beast was at our door travellers speak of the deep roar of the lion troubling the silence of the night amidst the rocky deserts of africa but while the tropical regions sultry and baked resound with the vibrations of the mighty voice of the savage monarch of the desert making the air tremble with the distant thunder of his awful cry the vast snowy deserts of the north too have their characteristic cry a strange lamentable yell that seems to suit the character of the dreary winter scene that voice of the northern desert is the howl of the wolf the instant after this awful sound had broken upon the silence followed another formidable body of discordant sounds the baying and yelling of sixty hounds answering from the ramparts of nidic the whole pack gave voice at the same moment the deep bay of the bloodhound the sharp cry of the pointer the plaintive yelpings of the spaniels and the melancholy howl of the mastiffs all mingling in confusion with the rattling of dog chains the shaking of the kennels under the struggles of the hounds to get loose and dominating over all the long dismal prolonged note of the wolf's monotonous howl his was the leading part in this horrible canine concert sperver sprang from his seat and ran out upon the platform to see if a wolf had dropped into the moat but no the howling came from neither then turning to us he cried fritz sibalt come come quickly we flew down the steps four at a time and rushed into the fencing school here we heard the cry of the wolf alone prolonged beneath the echoing arches the distant barking and yelling of the pack became almost inaudible in the distance the dogs were hoarse with rage and excitement their chains were getting entangled together perhaps they were strangling each other sperver drew the keen blade of his hunting knife Sibalt did the same. They preceded me down the gallery. Then the fearful sounds became our guide to the sick man's room. Sperver spoke no more. He hurried forward. Sibalt stretched his long legs. I felt a shuddering horror creep through my whole frame. A horrible presentiment of something shocking and abominable came over us. As we approached the apartments of the Count, we met the whole household afoot the gamekeepers the huntsmen the kennel keepers the scullions were all mingled and jostling each other asking what is the matter where are those cries coming from without stopping we ran into the passage which led to the count's bedroom where we met poor marie Legoutte, who alone had had the courage to penetrate thither before us she was holding in her arms the young countess who had fainted her head falling back her hair flowing down behind her she was carrying her away as fast as she could we passed her so rapidly that we scarcely had time to witness this sad sight but it has since returned to my memory and the pale face of odile lying on the ample shoulders of the good servant still makes a vivid impression upon my memory resembling the poor lamb presenting its throat to the knife without a complaint dying with fear before the stroke falls at last we had reached the count's chamber the howling came from behind his door we stole fearful glances at one another without attempting to account for the hideous noise or explaining the presence of such a wild guest in the house indeed we had no time our ideas were in dire and utter confusion sperver hastily pushed the door open and knife in hand was darting into the room but he stood arrested on the threshold motionless as a stone never have i seen such a picture of horror as he displayed standing rooted there with his eyes starting from his head and his mouth wide open and gasping for breath i gazed over his shoulder and the sight that met my eyes made the blood run chill as snow in my veins the lord of nidic crouching on all fours upon his bed with his arms bending forward his head carried low his eyes glaring with fierce fires was uttering loud protracted howlings 
he was the wolf that low receding forehead that sharp pointed face that foxy looking beard bristling off both cheeks the long meagre figure the sinewy limbs the face the cry the attitude declared the presence of the wild beast half hidden half revealed under a human mask at times he would stop for a second and listen attentively with head awry and then the crimson hangings would tremble with the quivering of his limbs like foliage shaken by the wind then the melancholy wail would open afresh sperver sabalt and i stood nailed to the floor we held our breath petrified with fear suddenly the count stopped as a wild beast scents the wind he lifted his head and listened again there there far away down among the thick fir forests whitened with dense patches of snow a cry was heard in reply weak at first then the sound rose and swelled in a long protracted howl drowning the feebler efforts of the hounds it was the she-wolf answering the wolf sperver turning round awe-stricken his countenance pale as ashes pointed to the mountain and murmured low listen there's the witch and the count still crouching motionless but with his head now raised in the attitude of attention his neck outstretched his eyes burning seemed to understand the meaning of that distant voice lost amidst the passes and peaks of the schwarzwald and a kind of fearful joy gleamed in his savage features at this moment sperver unable or unwilling to restrain himself any longer cried in a voice broken with emotion count of nidic what are you doing the count fell back thunderstruck we rushed into the room to his help it was time the third attack had commenced and it was terrible to witness End of chapter 8. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Chapter 9 of The Man Wolf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Man Wolf by Emile Erkman and Alexandre Chatrion. Chapter 9 The Lord of Nidic was in a dying state. What can science do in presence of the great mortal strife between death and life? At the supreme hour, when the invisible wrestlers are writhed together, body to body and limb to limb, panting, each in turn overthrowing and overthrown, what avails the healing art one can but watch and tremble and listen at times the struggle seems suspended a truce has sounded life has retired into her hold she is resting she is collecting the courage of despair but the relentless enemy beats at the gates he bursts in then life springs to the rescue and again grapples with her adversary the strife is renewed with fresh fuel added to the fire of mortal energy as the fatal issue draws closer and nearer and the exhausted patient himself the field of battle weltering in the cold sweat of death the eye set and the arm powerless can do nothing for himself his breathing sometimes short broken and distressing sometimes long deep labored and heavy indicates the varying phases of this dreadful struggle the bystanders watch each other's faces and they think the day will come when we in our turns shall be the field of the same strife and victorious death will bear us away into the grave his den as the spider carries away the fly but the true life the only life the soul spreading her immortal wings will speed her flight to another world with the exulting cry i have fought the good fight i have finished my course i have kept the faith 
and death disappointed of its prey will look up at the emancipated being unable to follow and holding in its clutches only a cold and decaying corpse soon to be a handful of dust o oh, death where is thy sting o oh, grave where is thy victory o oh, best and only consolation the hope and belief in the final triumph of justice the certainty of immortal life through jesus christ the saviour cruel indeed is he who would rob man of the chief brightness and glory of life towards midnight the count of nidic seemed almost gone the agony of death was at hand the broken weakened pulse indicated the sinking of the vital powers then it might return to a more active state but there seemed no hope my only duty left was to stay and see this unhappy man die i was exhausted with fatigue and anxiety whatever art could do i had tried i told sperver to sit up and close his master's eyes in death the poor faithful fellow was in the utmost distress he reproached himself with his involuntary cry count of nidic what are you doing and tore his hair in bitter repentance i went away alone to hugh lupus's tower having had scarcely any time to take food but i did not feel the want of it there was a bright fire on the hearth i threw myself dressed upon the bed and sleep soon came to relieve my weight of apprehension that heavy sleep broken by the consciousness that you may any minute be awoke by tears and lamentations i was sleeping thus with my face turned towards the fire and as it often happens the flame fitfully rising and falling threw a fluttering flickering light like those of ruddy flapping wings against the walls and wearied still more my dropping eyelids lost in a dreamy slumber i was half opening my eyes to see the cause of these alternate lights and shadows but the strangest sight surprised me close by the hearth hardly revealed by the feeble light of a few dying embers i recognized with dismay the dark profile of the black plague she sat upon a low stool and was evidently warming herself at first i thought myself deceived by my senses which would have been natural enough after the exciting scenes of the last few days i raised myself upon my elbow gazing with my eyes starting with fear and horror it was she indeed i lay horrified for there she sat calm and immovable with her hands clasped over her skinny knees just as i had seen her in the snow with her long scraggy neck outstretched her hooked nose her compressed lips how had the black pest got here how had she found her way into this high tower crowning the dangerous precipices everything that sperver had told me of this mysterious being seemed to be coming true and now the unaccountable behavior of liverle growling so fiercely against the wall seemed clear as the daylight i huddled myself close up into the alcove hardly daring to breathe and staring upon this motionless profile just as a mouse out of its hole fixes its paralyzed stare upon the cat that is watching for it the old woman stirred no more than the rock-hewn pillars on each side of the hearthstone and her lips were mumbling inarticulate sounds my heart was palpitating my fears increased momentarily during the long silence made more startling by the motionless supernatural figure that sat there before me this had lasted a quarter of an hour when the fire catching a splinter of fir wood a flash of light broke out the shaving twisted and flamed and a few rays of light flared to the end of the room that luminous jet was sufficient to show me that the creature was clothed in an old dress of rich purple silk as stiff as cardboard with a violet pattern there was a massive bracelet upon her left wrist and a gold arrow stuck through her thick gray hair twisted over the back of her head it was like an apparition out of the ages past still the plague could have had no hostile intentions towards me 
or she might easily have taken advantage of my sleep to have put them in execution that thought was beginning to give me some confidence when suddenly she rose from her seat and with slow steps approached my bed holding in her hand a torch which she had just lighted i then observed that her eyes were fixed and haggard i made an effort to rise and cry aloud but not a muscle of my body would obey my wishes not a breath came to my lips and the old woman bending over me between the curtains fixed her stony stare upon me with a strange unearthly smile i wanted to call for help i wanted to drive her from me but her petrifying stare seemed to fascinate and paralyze me just as that of the serpent fixes the little bird motionless before it during this speechless contemplation minutes seemed like hours what was she about to do i was ready for any event suddenly she turned her head went round upon her heel listened strode across the room and opened the door at last i recovered a little courage an effort of the will brought me to my feet as if i were acted on by a spring i darted after her footsteps she with one hand was holding her torch on high and with the other kept the door open i was about to seize her by the hair when at the end of the long gallery under the gothic archway of the castle leading to the ramparts i saw a tall figure it was the count of nidic the count of nidic whom i had thought a dying man clad in a huge wolf-skin thrown with its upper jaw projecting grimly over his eyes like a visor the formidable claws hanging over each shoulder and the tail dragging behind him along the flags he wore stout heavy shoes a silver clasp gathered the wolfskin round his neck and his whole aspect but for the ice-cold deathly expression of his face proclaimed the man born for command the master in the presence of such an imposing personage my ideas became vague and confused flight was no longer possible yet i had the presence of mind to throw myself into the embrasure of the window the count entered my room with his eyes fixed on the old woman and his features unrelaxed they spoke to one another in hoarse whispers so low that i could not distinguish a word but there was no mistaking their gestures the woman was pointing to the bed they approached the fireplace on tiptoe there in the dark shadow of the recess at its side the black plague with a horrible smile unrolled a large bag as soon as the count saw the bag he made a bound towards the bed and kneeled upon it with one knee there was a shaking of the curtains his body disappeared beneath their folds and i could only see one leg still resting on the floor and the wolf's tail undulating irregularly from side to side they seemed to be acting a murder in ghastly pantomime no real scene however frightful could have agitated me more than this mute representation of some horrible deed then the old woman ran to his assistance carrying the bag with her again the curtains shook and the shadows crossed the walls but the most horrible of all was that i fancied i saw a pool of blood creeping across the floor and slowly reaching the hearth but it was only the snow that had clung to the count's boots and was melting in the heat i was still gazing upon this dark stream feeling my dry tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth when there was a great movement the old woman and the count were stuffing the sheets of the bed into the sack they were thrusting and stamping them in with just the same haste as a dog scratching at a hole then the lord of nidic flung this unshapely bundle over his shoulder and made for the door a sheet was dragging behind him and the old woman followed him torch in hand they went across the court my knees were almost giving way under me they knocked together for fear i prayed for strength in a couple of minutes i was on their footsteps dragged forward by a sudden irresistible impulse i crossed the court at a run and was just going to enter the door of the tower when i perceived a deep but narrow pit at my feet 
down which went a winding staircase and there far below i could see the torch describing a spiral course around the stone rail like a little star at last it was lost in the distance now i also descended the first steps of this newly discovered staircase directing my course after this distant light suddenly it vanished the old woman and the count had reached the bottom of the precipice supported by the stone rail i continued my descent safe to be able to mount again if i found my further progress stopped soon i came to the last step i looked around me and discovered on my left hand a narrow streak of moonlight shining under a low door through the nestles and brambles i kicked a way through these obstacles clearing the snow away with my feet and then i found that i was at the very foot of the keep hugh's dungeon tower who would have supposed that such a hole would have led up into the castle who had shown it to the old woman i did not stay to satisfy myself on these points the vast plain lay spread before me bathed in a light almost equal to that of day on the right lay extended wide the dark line of the black forest with its craggy rocks its gullies its passes stretching away as far as the sight could reach the night air was keen and sharp but perfectly calm and i felt myself awakened to the highest degree almost as if my senses were volatilized by the still and ice-cold air my first examination of the horizon was for the figures of the count and his strange companion i soon distinguished their tall dark forms standing out sharply against the star-spangled purple heavens i nearly overtook them at the bottom of the ravine the count was moving with deliberate steps the imaginary winding sheet dragging slowly after him there was an automatic precision in the movements of both i kept six or eight yards behind them down the hollow road to the altenburg now in the shade now in the full light for the moon was shining with astonishing brilliancy a few clouds floated idly across the zenith seeming to want to clasp her in their long arms but she ever eluded their grasp and her rays keen as a blade of steel cut me to the marrow of my bones i could have wished to turn back but some invisible power impelled me onwards to follow this funeral procession in pantomime even to this day i fancy still i can see the rough mountain path through the black forest i can hear the crisp snow crackling underfoot and the dead leaves rustling in the light north wind i can see myself following those two silent beings but i cannot understand what mysterious power drew me in their footsteps at last we reach the forest and advance amongst the tall bare branched beeches the dark shadows of their higher boughs intersect the lower branches and fall broken upon the snow encumbered road sometimes i fancy i can hear steps behind me i turn sharply round but can see no one we had just reached the long rocky ridge that forms the crest of the altenburg behind it flows the torrent of the schneeberg but in winter no current is visible scarcely does a mere thread of its blue waters trickle under the thick crust of ice here the deep solitude is broken by no murmuring brooks no warblings of birds no thunder of the waterfall in the vast unbroken solitudes the awful silence is terrible the count of nideck and the old woman found a gap in the face of the rock up which they mounted straight with marvellous celerity whilst i had to pull myself up by the help of the bushes hardly had they reached the ridge of the crags which came almost to a point when i was within three yards of them and i beheld beyond a dreadful precipice of which i could not see the bottom at the left hung in the air like a vast sheet the fall of the schneeberg a mass of ice that resemblance to an immense wave taking the precipice at one bound bearing trees on its breast fringed with the bushes and winding out the long ivy sprays which exhibit in their delicate tracery the form of the rigid glassy billow 
that mere semblance of movement amidst the stillness and immovableness of death and the presence of those two speechless creatures pursuing their ghastly work with automatic precision added to the terror with which i already trembled nature herself seemed to shrink with horror the count had laid down his burden the old woman and he took it up together swung it for a moment over the edge of the precipice then the long shroud floated over the abyss and the imaginary murderers in silence bent forward to see it fall that long white sheet floating in the air is still present before my eyes it descends it falls like a wild swan shot in the clouds spreading its wide wings the long neck thrown back whirling down to earth to die the white burden disappeared in the dark depths of the precipice at last the cloud which i had long seen threatening to cover the moon's bright disk veiled her in its steel-blue folds and her rays ceased to shine the old woman holding the count by the hand and dragging him forward with hurried steps came for a moment into view the cloud had overshadowed the moon and i could not move out of their way without danger of falling over the precipice after a few minutes during which i lay as close as i could there was a rift in the cloud i looked out again i stood alone on the point of the peak with the snow up to my knees full of horror and apprehension i descended from my perilous position and ran to the castle in as much consternation as if i had been guilty of some great crime as for the lord of nideck and his companion i lost sight of them End of chapter 9. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Chapter 10 of The Man Wolf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Man Wolf by Emile Erkman and alexandre chatrian chapter ten i wandered around the castle of nideck unable to find the exit from which i had commenced my melancholy journey so much anxiety and uneasiness were beginning to tell upon my mind i staggered on wondering if i was not mad unable to believe in what i had seen and yet alarmed at the clearness of my own perceptions my mind in confusion passed in review that strange man waving his torch overhead in the darkness howling like a wolf coldly and accurately going through all the details of an imaginary murder without the omission of one ghastly detail or circumstance then escaping and committing to the furious torrent the secret of his crime these things all harassed my mind hurried confusedly past my eyes and made me feel as if i were laboring under a nightmare lost in the snow i ran to and fro panting and alarmed and unable to judge which way to direct my steps as day drew near the cold became sharper i shivered i execrated sperber for having brought me from fribourg to bear a part in this hideous adventure at last exhausted my beard a mass of ice my ears nearly frostbitten I discovered the gate and rang the bell with all my might it was then about four in the morning knapwurst made me wait a terribly long time his little lodge cut in the rock remained silent i thought the little humpbacked wretch would never have done dressing for of course i supposed he would be in bed and asleep i rang again this time his grotesque figure appeared abruptly and he cried to me from the door in a fury who are you i dr fritz oh that alters the case and he went back into his lodge for a lantern crossed the outer court where the snow came up to his middle and staring at me through the grating he exclaimed i beg your pardon dr fritz i thought you would be asleep up there in hugh lupus's tower were you ringing now that explains why sperver came to me about midnight to ask if anybody had gone out i said no which was quite true 
for I never saw you going out. But pray, Monsieur Knapwurst, do for pity's sake let me in, and I will tell you all about that by and by. Come, come, sir, a little patience. And the hunchback, with the slowest deliberation, undid the padlock and slipped the bars, whilst my teeth were chattering, and I stood shivering from head to foot. You are very cold, doctor, said the diminutive man, and you cannot get into the castle. Sperver has fastened the inside door. I don't know why. He does not usually do so. The outer gate is enough. Come in here and get warm. You won't find my little hole very inviting, though. It is nothing but a sty, but when a man is as cold as you are, he is not apt to be particular. Without replying to his chatter, I followed him in as quickly as I could. We went into the hut, and in spite of my complete state of numbness, I could not help admiring the state of picturesque disorder in which I found the place. The slate roof leaning against the rock and resting by its other side on a wall not more than six feet high showed the smoky, blackened rafters from end to end. The whole edifice consisted of but one apartment, furnished with a very uninviting bed, which the dwarf did not often take the trouble to make, and two small windows with hexagonal panes, weather-stained with the rainbow tints of mother-of-pearl. A large square table filled up the middle, and it would be difficult to account for that massive oak slab being got in, unless by supposing it to have been there before the hut was built. On shelves against the wall were rolls of parchment, and old books great and small. Wide open on the table lay a fine black letter volume, with illuminations, bound in vellum, clasped and cornered with silver, apparently a collection of old chronicles. Besides there was nothing but two leathern armchairs, bearing on them the unmistakable impression of the misshapen figure of this learned gentleman. I need not stay to do more than mention the pens, the jar of tobacco, five or six pipes lying here and there, and in a corner a small cast-iron stove with its low open door wide open, and throwing out now and then a volley of bright sparks. And to complete the picture, the cat arching her back, and spitting threateningly at me with her armed paw uplifted. All this scene was tinted with that deep, rich amber light in which the old Flemish painters delighted, and of which they alone possessed the secret, and never left it to the generations after them. "'So you went out last night, doctor?' inquired my host, after we had both installed ourselves, and while I had my hands in a warm place upon the stove. "'Yes, pretty early,' I answered. "'I had to look after a patient.' This brief explanation seemed to satisfy the little hunchback, and he lighted his blackened boxwood pipe, which was hanging over his chin. You don't smoke, doctor? I beg your pardon, I do. Well, fill any one of these pipes. I was here, he said, spreading his yellow hand over the open volume. I was reading the Chronicles of Herzog when you came. Ah, that accounts for the time I had to wait. Of course you stayed to finish the chapter. I said, smiling. He owned it, grinning, and we both laughed together. But if I had known it was you, he said, I should have finished the chapter another time. There was a short silence during which I was observing the very peculiar physiognomy of this misshapen being, those long, deep wrinkles that moated in his wide mouth, his small eyes with the crow's feet at the outer corners, that contorted nose, bulbous at its end and especially that huge double-storied forehead of his. The whole figure reminded me not a little of the received pictures of Socrates, and while warming myself and listening to the crackling of the fire, I went off into contemplations on the very diversified fortunes of mankind. Here is this dwarf, I thought, an ill-shaped, stunted caricature, banished into a corner of Nidic, and living just like the cricket that chirps beneath the hearthstone. Here is this little Knapwurst, who, in the midst of excitement, grand hunts, gallant trains of horsemen coming and going, the barking of the hounds, the trampling of the horses, and the shouts of the hunters, is living quietly all alone, buried in his books and thinking of nothing but the times long gone by, whilst joy or sorrow, songs or tears, fill the world around him, while spring and summer, 
autumn and winter come and look in through his dim windows by turns brightening warming and benumbing the face of nature outside whilst men in the outer world are subject to the gentle influences of love or the sterner impulses of ambition or avarice hoping coveting longing and desiring he neither hopes nor desires nor covets anything as long as he is smoking his pipe with his eyes feasting on a musty parchment he lives in the enjoyment of dreams and he goes into raptures over things long long ago gone by or which have never existed at all it is all one to him herzog says so and so somebody else tells the tale a different way and he is perfectly happy his leathery face gets more and more deeply wrinkled his broken angular back bends into sharper angles and corners his pointed elbows dig beds for themselves in the oak table his skinny fingers bury themselves in his cheeks his piggish gray eyes get redder over manuscripts latin greek or medieval he falls into raptures he smacks his lips he licks his chops like a cat over a dainty dish and then he throws himself upon that dirty litter with his knees up to his chin and he thinks he has had a delightful day o oh, providence of god is a man's duty best done are his responsibilities best discharged at the top or at the bottom of the scale of human life but the snow was melting away from my legs the balmy warmth of the stove was shedding a pleasant influence over my feelings and i felt myself reviving in this mixed atmosphere of tobacco smoke and burning pine wood knapwurst gravely laid his pipe on the table and reverently spreading his hand upon the folio said in a voice that seemed to issue from the bottom of his consciousness or if you like it better from the bottom of a twenty-gallon cask dr fritz here is the law and the prophets how so what do you mean parchment old parchment that is what i love these old yellow rusty worm-eaten leaves are all that is left to us of the past from the days of charlemagne until this day the oldest families disappear the old parchments remain where would be the glory of the hohenstaufens the leiningens the nidics and of so many other families of renown where would be the fame of their titles their deeds of arms their magnificent armor their expeditions to the holy land their alliances their claims to remote antiquity their conquests once complete now long ago annulled where would be all those grand claims to historic fame without these parchments nowhere at all those high and mighty barons those great dukes and princes would be as if they had never been they and everything that related to them far and near their strong castles their palaces their fortresses fall and moulder away into masses of ruin vague remembrancers of all that greatness one monument alone remains the chronicles the songs of bards and minnesingers parchment alone remains he sat silent for a moment and then pursued his reflections and in those distant times while knights and squires rode out to war and fought and conquered or fought and fell over the possession of a nook in a forest or a title or a smaller matter still with what scorn and contempt did they not look down upon the wretched little scribbler the man of mere letters and jargon half clothed in untanned hides his only weapon an inkhorn at his belt his pennon the feather of a goose quill how they laughed at him calling him an atom or a flea good for nothing he does nothing he cannot even collect our taxes or look after our estates whilst we bold riders armed to the teeth sword in hand and lance on thigh we fight and we are the finest fellows in the land so they said when they saw the poor devil dragging himself on foot after their horse's heels shivering in winter and sweating in summer rusting and decaying in old age well what has happened that flea that vermin has kept them in the memory of men longer than their castles stood long after their arms and their armor had rusted in the ground i love those old parchments i respect and revere them 
like ivy they clothe the ruins and keep the ancient walls from crumbling into dust and perishing in oblivion having thus delivered himself a solemn expression stole over his features and his own eloquence made the tears of moved affection to steal down his furrowed cheeks the poor hunchback evidently loved those who had borne with and protected his unwarlike but clever ancestors and after all he spoke truly and there was profound good sense in his words i was surprised and said monsieur knapwurst do you know latin yes sir he answered but without conceit both latin and greek i taught myself old grammars were quite enough there were some old books of the counts thrown by as rubbish they fell into my hands and i devoured them a little while after the count hearing me drop a latin quotation was quite astonished and said when did you learn latin knapwurst i taught myself monseigneur he asked me a few questions to which i gave pretty good answers parbleu he cried knapwurst knows more than i do he shall keep my records so he gave me the keys of the archives that was thirty years ago since that time i have read every word sometimes when the count sees me mounted upon my ladder he says what are you doing now knapwurst i am reading the family archives monseigneur aha is that what you enjoy yes very much come come i am glad to hear it knapwurst but for you who would know anything about the glory of the house of nidick and off he goes laughing i do just as i please so he is a very good master is he oh dr fritz he is the kindest-hearted master he is so frank and so pleasant cried the dwarf with hands clasped he has but one fault and what may that be he has no ambition how do you prove that why he might have been anything he pleased think of a nidic one of the very noblest families in germany he had but to ask to be made a minister or a field marshal well he desired nothing of the sort when he was no longer a young man he retired from political life except that he was in the campaign in france at the head of a regiment he raised at his own expense he has always lived far away from noise and battle plain and simple and almost unknown he seemed to think of nothing but his hunting these details were deeply interesting to me the conversation was of its own accord taking just the turn i wished it to take and i resolved to get my advantage out of it so the count has never had any exciting deeds in hand none dr fritz none whatever and that is the pity a noble excitement is the glory of great families it is a misfortune for a noble race when a member of it is devoid of ambition he allows his family to sink below its level i could give you many examples that which would be very fortunate in a trader's family is the greatest misfortune in a nobleman's i was astonished for all my theories upon the count's past life were falling to the earth still monsieur knapwurst the lord of nidick has had great sorrows had he not such as what the loss of his wife yes you are right there his wife was an angel he married her for love she was a zahn one of the oldest and best nobility of alsace but a family ruined by the revolution the countess odile was the delight of her husband she died of a decline which carried her off after five years illness every plan was tried to save her life they traveled in italy together but she returned worse than she went and died a few weeks after their return the count was almost broken-hearted and for two years he shut himself up and would see no one he neglected his hounds and his horses time at last calmed his grief but there is always a remainder of grief said the hunchback pointing with his finger to his heart you understand very well there is still a bleeding wound old wounds you know make themselves felt in change of weather and old sorrows too in spring when the flowers bloom again and in autumn when the dead leaves cover the soil but the count would not marry again 
all his love is given to his daughter so the marriage was a happy one throughout happy why it was a blessing for everybody i said no more it was plain that the count had not committed and could not have committed a crime i was obliged to yield to evidence but then what was the meaning of that scene at night that strange connection with the black pest that fearful acting that remorse in a dream which impelled the guilty to betray their past atrocities i lost myself in vain conjectures knapwurst relighted his pipe and handed me one which i accepted by that time the icy numbness which had laid hold of me had nearly passed away and i was enjoying that pleasant sense of relief which follows great fatigue when by the chimney corner in a comfortable easy chair veiled in wreaths of tobacco smoke you yield to the luxury of repose and listen idly to the duet between the chirping of a cricket on the hearth and the hissing of the burning log so we sat for a quarter of an hour at last i ventured to remark but sometimes the count gets angry with his daughter knapwurst started and fixing a sinister almost a fierce and hostile eye upon me answered i know i know i watched him narrowly thinking i might learn something now in support of my theory but he simply added ironically the towers of nidic are high and slander flies too low to reach their elevation no doubt but still it is a fact is it not oh yes so it is but after all it is only a craze an effect of his complaint as soon as the crisis is past all his love for mademoiselle comes back i assure you sir that a lover of twenty could not be more devoted more affectionate than he is that young girl is his pride and joy a dozen times have i seen him riding away to get a dress or flowers or what not for her he went off alone and brought back the articles in triumph blowing his horn he would have entrusted so delicate a commission to no one not even to sperver whom he is so fond of mademoiselle never dares express a wish in his hearing lest he should start off and fulfil it at once the lord of nidic is the worthiest master the tenderest father and the kindest and most upright of men those poachers who are forever infesting our woods the old count ludwig would have strung them up without mercy our count winks at them he even turns them into gamekeepers look at sperver why if count ludwig were alive sperver's bones would long ago have been rattling in chains instead of which he is head huntsman at the castle all my theories were now in a state of disorganization i laid my head between my hands and thought a long while knapwurst supposing that i was asleep had turned to his folio again the gray dawn was now peeping in and the lamp turning pale indistinct voices were audible in the castle suddenly there was a noise of hurried steps outside i saw someone pass before the window the door opened abruptly and gideon appeared at the threshold end of chapter 10 recording by james k white chula vista chapter 11 of the man wolf this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. The Man Wolf by Emile Erkman and Alexandra Chatrion. Chapter 11. Sperver's pale face and glowing eyes announced that events were on their way. Yet he was calm and did not seem surprised at my presence in Knapwurst's room fritz he said briefly i am come to fetch you i rose without answering and followed him scarcely were we out of the hut when he took me by the arm and drew me on to the castle mademoiselle odile wants to see you he whispered what is she ill no she is much better but something or other that is strange is going on this morning about one o'clock thinking that the count was nearly breathing his last i went to wake the countess with my hand on the bell my heart failed me why should i break her heart i said to myself 
she will learn her misfortune only too soon and then to wake her up in the middle of the night weak and frail as she is after such shocks might kill her at a stroke i took a few minutes to consider and then i resolved i would take it all on myself i returned to the count's room i looked in not a soul was there impossible the man was in the last agonies of death i ran into the corridor like a madman no one was there into the long gallery no one then i lost my presence of mind and rushing again into the young countess's room i rang again this time she appeared crying out is my father dead no has he disappeared yes madam i had gone out for a minute when i came in again and dr fritz where is he in hugh lupus's tower in that tower she started she threw a dressing gown around her took her lamp and went out i stayed behind a quarter of an hour after she came back her feet covered with snow and so pale and so cold she set her lamp upon the chimney-piece and looking at me fixedly said was it you who put the doctor into that tower yes madam unhappy man you will never know the extent of the harm you have done i was about to answer but she interrupted me no more go and fasten every door and lie down i will sit up tomorrow morning you will find dr fritz at knapworth's and bring him to me make no noise and mind you have seen nothing and know nothing is that all sperver i asked he nodded gravely and about the count he is in again he is better we had got to the antechamber gideon knocked at the door gently then he opened it announcing dr fritz i took a pace forward and stood in the presence of odile sperver had retired closing the door a strange impression crossed my mind at the sight of the young countess standing pale and still leaning upon the back of an armchair her eyes of feverish brightness and robed in a long dress of rich black velvet but she stood calm and firm doctor she said motioning me to a chair pray sit down i have a very serious matter to speak to you about i obeyed in silence in her turn she sat down and seemed to be collecting her thoughts providence or an evil destiny i know not which has made you witness of a mystery in which lies involve the honor of my family so she knew it all i sat confounded and astonished madam believe me it was but by chance it is useless she interrupted i know it all and it is frightful then in a heart-rending appealing voice she cried my father is not a guilty man i shuddered and with hands outstretched cried madam i know it i know that the life of your father has been one of the noblest and loveliest odile had half risen from her seat as if to protest by anticipation against any supposition that might be injurious to her father hearing me myself taking up his defence she sank back again and covering her face with her hands the tears began to flow god bless you sir she exclaimed i should have died with the very thought that a breath of suspicion was harboured against him ah madam who could possibly attach any reality to the action of a somnambulist that is quite true sir i had had that thought myself but appearances pardon me yet i feared still i knew dr fritz was a man of honor pray madam be calm no she cried let me weep on it is such a relief for ten years i have suffered in secret oh how i suffered that secret so long shut up in my breast was killing me i should soon have died like my dear mother god has had pity upon me and has sent you and made you share it with me let me tell you all sir do let me she could speak no more sobs and tears broke her voice 
so it always is with proud and lofty natures after having conquered grief and imprisoned it buried and as it were crushed down in the secret depths of the mind they seem happy or at any rate indifferent to the eyes of the uninformed around and the eye of the most watchful observer might be mistaken but let a sudden shock break the seal an unexpected rending of a portion of the veil then as with the crash of a thunderstorm the tower in which the sufferer hid his sorrow falls in ruins to the ground the conquered foe rises more fierce than before his defeat and captivity he shakes with fury the prison doors the frame trembles with long shudderings sobs and sighs heave the breast the tears too long contained within bounds overflow their swollen banks bounding and rushing as if after the heavy rain of a thunderstorm such was odile at length she lifted her beautiful head she wiped her tear-stained cheeks and with her arm on the elbow of her chair her cheek resting on her hand and her eyes tenderly fixed on a picture on the wall she resumed in slow and melancholy tones when i go back into the past sir when i return to my first impressions my mother's is the picture before me she was a tall pale and silent woman she was still young at the period to which i am referring she was scarcely thirty and yet you would have thought her fifty her brow was silvered round with hair white as snow her thin hollow cheeks her sharp clear profile her lips ever closed together with an expression of pain gave to her features a strange character in which pride and pain seemed to contend for the mastery there was nothing left of the elasticity of youth in that aged woman of thirty nothing but her tall upright figure her brilliant eyes and her voice which was always as gentle and as sweet as a dream of childhood she often walked up and down for hours in this very room with her head hanging down and i an unthinking child ran happily along by her side never aware that my mother was sad never understanding the meaning of the deep melancholy revealed by those furrows that traversed her fair brow i knew nothing of the past to me the present was joy and happiness and oh the future the dark miserable future there was none my only future was tomorrow's play odile smiled bitterly and went on sometimes i would happen in my noisy play to disturb my mother in her silent walk then she would stop look down and seeing me at her feet would slowly bend kiss me with an absent smile and then again resume her interrupted walk and her sad gait since then sir whenever i have desired to search back in my memory for remembrances of my early days that tall pale woman has risen before me the image of melancholy there she is pointing to a picture on the wall there she is not such as illness made her as my father supposes but that fatal and terrible secret see i turned round and as my eye dwelt upon the portrait the lady pointed to i shuddered it was a long pale thin face cold and rigid as death and only luridly lighted up by two dark deep-set eyes fixed burning and of a terrible intensity there was a moment's silence how much that woman must have suffered i said to myself with a pain striking at my heart i know not how my mother made that terrible discovery added odile but she became aware of the mysterious attraction of the black pest and their meetings in hugh lupus's tower she knew it all all she never suspected my father ah no but she perished away by slow degrees under this consuming influence and i myself am dying i bowed my head into my hands and wept in silence one night she went on one night i was only ten and my mother with the remains of her superhuman energy for she was near her end that night came to me when i lay asleep it was in winter a stony cold hand caught me by the wrist i looked up before me stood a tall woman in one hand she held a flaming torch 
with the other she held me by the arm her robe was sprinkled with snow there was a convulsive movement in all her limbs and her eyes were fired with a gloomy light through the long locks of white hair which hung in disorder round her face it was my mother and she said odile my child get up and dress you must know it all then taking me to hugh lupus's tower she showed me the open subterranean passage your father will come out that way she said pointing to the tower he will come out with the she-wolf don't be frightened he won't see you and presently my father bearing his funeral burden came out with the old woman my mother took me in her arms and followed she showed me the dismal scene on the altenburg of which you know look my child she said you must for i am going to die soon you will have to keep that secret you alone are to sit up with your father she said impressively you alone the honor of your family depends upon you and so we returned a fortnight after my mother died leaving me her will to accomplish and her example to follow i have scrupulously obeyed her injunctions as a sacred command but oh at what a sacrifice you have seen it all i have been obliged to disobey my father and to rend his heart if i had married i should have brought a stranger into the house and betrayed the secret of our race i resisted no one in this castle knows of the somnambulism of my father and but for yesterday's crisis which broke down my strength completely and prevented me from sitting up with my father i should still have been its sole depositary god has decreed otherwise and has placed the honor and reputation of my family in your keeping i might demand of you sir a solemn promise never to reveal what you have seen tonight. i should have a right to do so madam i said rising i am ready no sir she replied with much dignity i will not put such an affront upon you oaths fail to bind base men and honor alone is a sufficient guarantee for the upright you will keep that secret sir i know you will keep it because it is your duty to do so but i expect more than this of you much more and this is why i consider myself obliged to tell you all she rose slowly from her seat dr fritz she resumed in a voice which made every nerve within me quiver with deep emotion my strength is unequal to my burden i bend beneath it i need a helper a friend will you be that friend madam i replied rising from my seat i gratefully accept your offer of friendship i cannot tell you how proud i am of your confidence but still allow me to unite with it one condition pray speak sir i mean that i will accept that title of friend with all the duties and obligations which it shall impose upon me what duties do you mean there is a mystery overhanging your family that mystery must be discovered and solved at any cost that black pest must be apprehended we must find out where she comes from what she is and what she wants oh but that is impossible she said with a movement of despair who can tell that madam perhaps divine providence may have had a design connected with me in sending sperver to fetch me here you are right sir god never acts without consummate wisdom do whatever you think right i give my approval in advance i raised to my lips the hand which she tremblingly placed in mine and went out full of admiration for this frail and feeble woman who was nevertheless so strong in the time of trial is anything grander than duty nobly accomplished end of chapter 11 recording by james k white chula vista chapter 12 of the man wolf this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by james k white chula vista the man wolf by emile erkman and alexandra chatrion chapter 12 
an hour after the conversation with odile sperver and i were riding hard and leaving nidick rapidly behind us the huntsman bending forward over his horse's neck encouraged him with voice and action he rode so fast that his tall mecklenburger her mane flying tail outstretched and legs extended wide seemed almost motionless so swiftly did she cleave the air as for my little ardain pony i think he was running right away with his rider Lieberle accompanied us flying alongside of us like an arrow from the bow a whirlwind seemed to sweep us in our headlong way the towers of nidick were far away and sperver was keeping ahead as usual when i shouted hello comrade pull up halt before we go any farther let us know what we are about he faced round only just tell me fritz is it right or is it left no that won't do it is of the first importance that you should know the object of our journey in short we are going to catch the hag a flush of pleasure brightened up the long sallow face of the old poacher and his eyes sparkled ha ha he cried i knew we should come to that at last and he slipped his rifle round from his shoulder into his hand this significant action roused me wait sperver we're not going to kill the black pest but to take her alive alive no doubt and it will spare you a good deal of remorse perhaps if i declare to you that the life of this old woman is bound up with that of your master the ball that hits her hits your lord sperver gazed at me in astonishment is this really true fritz positively true there was a long silence our mounts fox and rappel tossed their heads at each other as if in the act of saluting one another scraping up the snow with their hoofs in congratulation upon so pleasant an expedition Lieberle opened wide his red mouth gaping with impatience extending and bending his long meagre body like a snake and sperver sat motionless his hand still upon his gun well let us try and catch her alive we will put on gloves if we have to touch her but it is not so easy as you think fritz and pointing out with extended hand the panorama of mountains which lay unrolled about us like a vast amphitheatre he added look there's the altenberg the schneeberg the oxenhorn the rathal the berenkopf and if we only got up a little higher we should see fifty more mountain tops far away right into the palatinate there are rocks and ravines passes and valleys torrents and waterfalls forests and more mountains here beeches there firs then oaks and the old woman has got all that for her camping ground she tramps everywhere and lives in a hole wherever she pleases she has a sure foot a keen eye and can scent you a couple of miles off how are you going to catch her then if it was an easy matter where would be the merit i should not then have chosen you to take part in it that is all very fine fritz if we only had one end of her trail who knows but with courage and perseverance as for her trail don't trouble about that that's my business yours yes mine what do you know about following up a trail why should i not oh if you are so sure of it and you know more about it than i do of course march on and i'll follow it was easy to see that the old hunter was vexed that i should presume to trespass upon his special province therefore only laughing inwardly i required no repetition of the request to lead on and i turned sharply to the left sure of coming across the old woman's trail who after having left the count at the postern gate must have crossed the plain to reach the mountain sperver rode behind me now whistling rather contemptuously and i could hear him now and then grumbling what is the use of looking for the track of the she-wolf in the plain of course she went along the forest side just as usual but it seems she has altered her habits and now walks about with her hands in her pockets like a respectable freeborg tradesman out for a walk i turned a deaf ear to his hints but in a moment i heard him utter an exclamation of surprise then fixing a keen eye upon me he said fritz you know more than you choose to tell 
how so gideon the track that i should have been a week finding you have got it at once come that's not all right where do you see it then oh don't pretend to be looking at your feet and pointing out to me at some distance a scarcely perceptible white streak in the snow there she is immediately he galloped up to it i followed in a couple of minutes we had dismounted and were examining the track of the black pest i should like to know cried sperver how that track came here don't let that trouble you i replied you are right fritz don't mind what i say sometimes i do speak rather at random what we want now is to know where that track will lead us to and now the huntsman knelt on the ground i was all ears he was closely examining it is a fresh track he pronounced last night's it is a strange thing fritz during the count's last attack that old witch was hanging about the castle then examining with greater care she passed here between three and four o'clock this morning how can you tell that it is quite a fresh track there is sleet all round it last night about twelve i came out to shut the doors there was sleet falling then there is none upon the footsteps therefore she has passed since that is true enough sperver but it may have been made much later for instance at eight or nine no look there is frost upon it the fog that freezes on the snow only comes at daybreak the creature passed here after the sleet and before the fog that is about three or four this morning i was astonished at sperver's exactitude he rose from his knee clapping his hands together to get rid of the snow and looking at me thoughtfully as if speaking to himself said it is twelve is it not fritz a quarter to twelve very well then the old woman has got seven hours start of us we must follow upon her trail step by step on horseback we can do it in half the time and if she is still going about seven or eight tonight we have got her fritz now then we're off and we started afresh upon the track it led us straight to the mountains galloping away sperver said if good luck only would have it that she had rested an hour or two in a hole in a rock we might be up with her before the daylight is gone let us hope so gideon oh don't think of it the old she-wolf is always moving she never tires she tramps along all the hollows in the black forest we must not flatter ourselves with vain hopes if perhaps she has stopped on her journey so much the better for us and if she still keeps going we won't let that discourage us come on at a gallop it is a very strange feeling to be hunting down a fellow creature for after all that unhappy woman was of our own kind and nature endowed like ourselves with an immortal soul to be saved she felt and thought and reflected like ourselves it is true that a strange perversion of human nature had brought her near to the nature of the wolf and that some great mystery overshadowed her being no doubt a wandering life had obliterated the moral sense in her and even almost effaced the human character but still nothing in the world can give one man a right to exercise over another the dominion of the man over the brute and yet a burning ardor hurried us on in pursuit my blood was at fever heat i was determined to stand at no obstacle in laying hold of this extraordinary being a wolf hunt or a boar hunt would not have excited me near so much the snow was flying in our rear sometimes splinters of ice bitten off by the horseshoes like shavings of iron from machinery whizzed past our ears sperver sometimes with his nose in the air and his red moustache floating in the wind sometimes with his grey eyes intently following the track reminded me of those famous cossacks that i had seen pass through germany when i was a boy and his tall lanky horse muscular and full-maned its body as slender as a greyhound's completed the illusion Liverle, in a high state of enthusiasm and excitement took bounds sometimes as high as our horses backs and i could not but tremble at the thought that when we came up at last with the pest 
he might tear her in pieces before we could prevent him but the old woman gave us all the trouble she could on every hill she doubled at every hillock there was a false track after all it is easy here cried sperver to what it will be in the wood we shall have to keep our eyes open there do you see the accursed beast here she has confused the track there she has been amusing herself sweeping the trail and then from that height which is exposed to the wind she has slipped down to the stream and has crept along through the cresses to get to the underwood but for those two footsteps she would have sold us completely we had just reached the edge of a pine forest in woods of this description the snow never reaches the ground except in the open spaces between the trees the dense foliage intercepting it in its fall this was a difficult part of our enterprise sperver dismounted to see our way better and placed me on his left so as not to be hindered by my shadow here were large spaces covered with dead leaves and the needles and cones of the fir trees which retain no footprint it was therefore only in the open patches where the snow had fallen on the ground that sperver found the track again it took us an hour to get through this thicket the old poacher bit his moustache with excitement and vexation and his long nose visibly bent into a hook when i was only opening my mouth to speak he would impatiently say don't speak it bothers me at last we descended a valley to the left and gideon pointing to the track of the she-wolf outside the edge of the brushwood triumphantly remarked there is no feint in this sortie for once we may follow this track confidently why so because the pest has a habit every time she doubles of going three paces to the right then she retraces her steps four five or six in the other direction and jumps away into a clear place but when she thinks she has sufficiently disguised her trail she breaks out without troubling herself to make any feints there now what did i say now she is burrowing beneath the brushwood like a wild boar and it won't be so difficult to follow her up well let us put the track between us and smoke a pipe we halted and the honest fellow whose countenance was beginning to brighten up looking up at me with enthusiasm cried fritz if we have luck this will be one of the finest days in my life if we catch the old hag i will strap her across my horse behind me like a bundle of old rags there is only one thing troubles me and what is that that i forgot my bugle i should have liked to have sounded the return on getting near the castle <laughs> he lighted his stump of a pipe and we galloped off again the track of the she-wolf now passed on to the heights of the forest by so steep an ascent that several times we had to dismount and lead our horses by the bridle there she is turning to the right said sperver in this direction the mountains are craggy perhaps one of us will have to lead both horses while the other climbs to look after the trail but don't you think the light is going the landscape now was assuming an aspect of grandeur and magnificence vast gray rocks sparkling with long icicles raised here and there their sharp peaks like breakers amidst a snowy sea there is nothing more sadly impressive than the aspect of winter in a mountainous region the jagged crests of the precipices the deep dark ravines the woods sparkling with boar frost like diamonds all form a picture of desertion desolation and unspeakable melancholy the silence is so profound that you hear a dead leaf rustling on the snow or the needle of the fur dropping to the ground such a silence is oppressive as the tomb it urges on the mind the idea of man's nothingness in the vastness of creation how frail a being is man two winters together without a summer between would sweep him off the earth at times we felt it a necessity to be saying something if only to show that we were keeping up our spirits ah we are getting on how fearfully cold leverle what is the matter what have you found now unfortunately fox and rappel were beginning to tire they sank deeper in the snow and no longer neighed joyfully and added to this the endless mazes of the black forest wearied us too 
the old woman affected this solitary region greatly here she had trotted round a deserted charcoal burner's hut farther on she had torn out the roots that projected from a moss-grown rock there she had sat at the foot of a tree and that very recently not more than two hours since for the track was quite fresh and our hope and our ardor rose together but the daylight was slowly fading away very strangely ever since our departure from nidic we had met neither woodcutters nor charcoal burners nor timber carriers at this season the silence and solitude of the black forest is as deep as that of the north american steppes at five o'clock it was almost dark sperver halted and said fritz my lad we have started a couple of hours too late the she-wolf has had too long a start in ten minutes it will be as dark as a dungeon the best way would be to reach roche cruz which is twenty minutes ride from here light a good fire and eat our provisions and empty our flasks when the moon is up we will follow the trail again and unless the old hag is the foul fiend himself ten to one we shall find her dead and stiff with cold against the foot of a tree for nothing can live after such a tremendous tramp in weather like this sibalt is the best walker in the black forest and he would not have stood it come fritz what is your opinion i am not so mad as to think differently besides i am perishing with hunger well let us start again he took the lead and passed into a close and narrow glen between two precipitous faces of rock the fir trees met over our heads under our feet ran a mere thread of the stream and from time to time some ray from above was dimly reflected in the depths below and glinted with a dull leaden light the darkness was now such that i thought it prudent to drop my bridle on rappel's neck the steps of our horses on the slippery gravel awoke strange discordant sounds like the screaming of monkeys at play the echoes from rock to rock caught up and repeated every sound and in the distance a tiny space of deep blue widened as we advanced it was the issue from the glen fritz said sperver we are in the bed of the tunkelbach this is the wildest spot in the black forest the end is a pit called la marmite du grand goulard the muckle-mouthed giant's kettle in the spring when the snow is melting the tunkelbach hurls all its waters into it a depth of two hundred feet there is an awful uproar the waters dash down and then splash up again and fall in spray on all the hills around sometimes it even fills the roche cruz but just now it must be as dry as a powder flask whilst i was listening to gideon's explanations i was at the same time meditating upon this dark and fearful glen and i reflected that the instinct which attracts the brutes into such retreats as these far from the light of heaven away from everything bright and cheerful must partake of the nature of remorse those animals which love the open sunshine the goat aloft upon a high conspicuous peak the horse flying across the wide plain the dog capering round his master the bird bathed in sunlight all breathe joy and happiness they bask and sing and rejoice in dancing and delight the kid nibbling the tender grass under the shade of the great trees is as poetic an object as the shelter that it loves the fierce boar is as rough as the tangled brakes through which he loves to run his huge bristly back the eagle is as proud and lofty as the sky-piercing crags on which he perches as his home the lion is as majestic as the arching vaults of the caves where he makes his den but the wolf the fox and the ferret seek the darkness that conforms to their ugly deeds fear and remorse dog their steps I was still dreamily pursuing these thoughts, and I was beginning to feel the keen air moving upon my face, for we were approaching the outlet of the gorge, when all at once a red light struck the rock a hundred feet above us, purpling the dark green of the fir trees and lighting up the wreaths of snow. Ha! cried Sperver. We've got her at last. My heart leaped. We stood, closely pressed, the one against the other. The dog growled low and deep. Cannot she escape? 
I asked in a whisper. No. She is caught like a rat in a trap. There is no way out of La Marmite du Grand Goulard but this. And everywhere, all round, the rocks are two hundred feet high. Now, vile hag, I hold you. He alighted in the ice-cold stream, handing me his bridle. I caught in the silence the click of the lock of his gun, and that slight noise threw me into a tremor of apprehension. Sperber, what are you about? Don't be alarmed. It is only to frighten her. Very well, then, but no blood. Remember what I told you. The ball which strikes the pest slays the count. Don't trouble yourself, was the answer. He went away without further parley. I could hear the splash of his feet in the water. Then I saw his tall figure emerge at the opening of the dark glen, black against a purple background. He stood five minutes motionless. Attentive, bending forward, I looked and listened, still moving onward. As he returned, I was but a few yards from him. Hark, he whispered mysteriously. Look there. At the end of the hollow, scooped out perpendicularly like a quarry in the mountainside, I saw a bright fire unrolling its golden spires beneath the vault of a cave, and before the fire sat a man with his hands clasped about his knees, whom I recognized by his dress as the Baron de Zimmerbluderick. He sat motionless, his forehead resting between his hands. Behind him lay a dark, gaunt form extended on the ground. Farther on, his horse, half lost in the shade, reared his neck, gazed on us with eyes fixed, ears erect, and nostrils distended. I stood rooted to the ground. How did the Baron de Zimmer happen to be in that lonely wilderness at such a time? What did he want here? Had he lost his way? The most contradictory conjectures were passing in confusion through my excited brain and I could not tell what conclusion to arrive at when the baron's horse began to neigh, and the master raised his head. "'Well, Donner, what is the matter now?' said he. Then he, too, directed his gaze our way, straining his eyes through the darkness. That pale face with its strongly marked features, thin lips and thick black eyebrows meeting together and forming a deep hollow on the brow in the form of a long vertical wrinkle would have struck me with admiration at any other time, while now an inexplicable anxiety laid hold of me, and I was filled with vague apprehensions. Suddenly the young man exclaimed, "'Who goes there?' "'I, Monseigneur,' answered Sperver, coming forward. "'Sperver, chief huntsman to the Lord of Nidic. A flash shot from the baron's quick eye. Not a muscle of his countenance quailed. He rose to his feet, gathering his pelisse over his shoulders. I drew towards me the horses and the dog, and this animal suddenly began howling fearfully. Is not everyone, more or less, subject to superstitious fears? At these dismal sounds I trembled, and a cold shudder crept through my whole body. Sperver and the baron stood at a distance of fifty yards from each other. The first, immovable in the midst of the deep glen, his gun unslung from his shoulder, the other erect upon the level platform outside of the cave, carrying his head high, fixing on us a haughty eye and a proud look of superiority. "'What do you want here?' he asked aggressively. "'We are looking for a woman,' replied the old poacher, "'a woman who comes every year prowling about Nidic, and our orders are to take her.' "'Has she stolen anything?' "'No.' Has she committed murder? No, Monseigneur. Then what do you want with her? What right have you to pursue her? And you? What right have you over her? Answered Sperver, with an ironical smile. See? There she is. I can see her at the bottom of the cave. What right have you to meddle with our affairs? Don't you know that we are here in the domains of Nidic, and that we administer justice and execute our own decrees? The young man changed color and said coldly, I have no account to render to you. Beware, replied Sperver. I am come with proposals of peace and conciliation. I am here on behalf of the Lord Yeri Hans, 
I am in the execution of my duty, and you are putting yourself in the wrong. Your duty? cried the young man bitterly. If you talk about your duty, you will oblige me to do mine. Well, do it, cried the huntsman, whose features were becoming disturbed with anger. No, replied the baron. I am not responsible to you, and you shall not come here. That's what we shall soon see, said Sperver, drawing nearer to the cave. The young man drew his hunting knife. Perceiving this menacing action, I was about to dart between them, but happily the hound which I was holding by his collar slipped from me with a violent shock and threw me on the ground. I thought the baron would be lost, but at that instant a wild shriek rose from the dark bottom of the cavern, and as I rose to my feet I saw the old woman standing erect before the fire, her tattered garments hanging loosely about her, her grey and tangled locks floating wildly in the wind. She flung her bony arms in the air, and uttered prolonged piercing howls, like the cry of agony of the hungry wolf in the long cold nights of winter, when famine is gnawing his entrails. Never in my life have I seen a more fearful apparition. Sperber, motionless, his eyes riveted on the fearful object before him, and his mouth open with astonishment, stood as if rooted to the earth. But the powerful dog, surprised himself at this unexpected sight, stood still for a moment. Then, with a bend of his bristling back in preparation for a mighty leap, he made a rush with a deep, impatient growl which made me tremble. The platform before the cave was about eight or nine feet from the level where we stood, or he would have reached it at a single bound. I can yet hear him clearing away through the snowy brambles, the baron flinging himself before the woman with a piercing cry, My mother! Then the dog taking another spring, and Sperver, quick as lightning, raising his gun and bringing down the poor animal dead at the young man's feet. This was but the work of a second. The gulf had been illuminated with a momentary flash, and the wild echoes were vibrating with the explosion from rock to rock till it died in the far distance. Then silence again settled on the gloomy scene, as darkness after the lightning. When the smoke of the explosion had cleared away, I saw Liverle lying outstretched at the foot of the rock, and the woman fainting in the arms of the young man. Sperver, pale with concentrated rage and excitement, and eyeing the young baron darkly, dropped the butt of his gun to the ground, his features discomposed, and his eyes half hid in his gloomy frown. Senor de Bluderich, he cried, with his hand extended, I have killed my best friend to save the life of that unhappy woman, your mother. Thank God that her life is bound up with that of the Count of Nidic. Take her away. Take her hence, and never let her return here again. If you do, I cannot answer for what old Sperver may be driven to do. Then, with a glance at the poor dog, Oh, Liverle, Liverle, he cried, was it to end thus? Come, Fritz, let us go. I cannot stay here. I might do something that I should have to repent of and, laying hold of Fox by the mane, he was going to throw himself into the saddle, but suddenly his feelings of distress overcame all restraint, and bowing his head upon his horse's neck, he burst into sobs and tears, and wept like a child. End of chapter 12 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Chapter Thirteen of the Man Wolf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Man Wolf by Emile Erkman and Alexandre Chatrion. Chapter Thirteen. Sperver had gone, bearing the body of poor Liverle in his cloak. I had declined to follow. My sense of duty kept me by this unhappy woman, and I could not leave her without violence to my own feelings. Besides, 
I must confess I was curious to see a little more closely this strange, mysterious being, and therefore, as soon as Sperver had disappeared in the darkness of the glen, I began to climb up to reach the cavern. There I beheld a strange sight. Extended upon a large cloak of white fur lay the aged woman in a long and ragged robe of purple, her fingers clutching her breast, a golden arrow through her gray hair. Never shall I forget the figure of this strange woman, her vulture-like features distorted with the last agonies of death, her eyes set, her gasping mouth were fearful to look upon. Such might have been the terrible queen Fridegonda. The baron, on his knees at her side, trying to restore her to animation, but I saw at a glance that the wretched creature was dying, and it was not without a profound sense of pity that I took her by the arm. "'Leave Madame alone. Don't touch her,' cried the young man with irritation. "'I am a surgeon, Monseigneur.' He looked in silence at me for a moment, then rising, said, "'Pardon me, sir. Pray forgive my hasty language.' He trembled with excitement, scarcely yet subdued, and presently he went on, "'What is your opinion, sir?' "'It is over.' She is dead. Then, without speaking another word, he sat upon a large stone, with his forehead resting upon his hand, and his elbow on his knee, his eyes motionless, as still as a statue. I sat near the fire, watching the flames rising to the vaulted roof of the cave, and casting lurid reflections upon the rigid features of the corpse. We had sat there an hour, as motionless as statues, each deep in thought, when, suddenly lifting his head, the baron said, "'Sir, all this utterly confounds me. Here is my mother. For twenty-six years I thought I knew her, and now an abyss of horrible mysteries opens before me. You are a doctor. Tell me, did you ever know anything so dreadful?' "'Monseigneur,' I replied, "'the Count of Nidic is afflicted with a complaint strikingly similar to that from which your mother appears to have suffered. If you feel enough confidence in me to communicate to me the facts which you have yourself observed, I will gladly tell you what I know myself, for perhaps this exchange of our experiences might supply me with the means to save my patient. Willingly, sir, he replied, and without any further prelude he informed me that the Baroness de Bluderick, a member of one of the noblest families in Saxony, took, every year towards autumn, a journey into Italy, with no attendant besides an old manservant, who possessed her entire confidence, that that man, being at the point of death, had desired a private interview with the son of his old master, and that at that last hour, prompted, no doubt, by the pangs of remorse, he had told the young man that his mother's visit to Italy was only a pretense to enable her to make, you observed, a certain excursion into the Black Forest, the object of which was unknown to himself, but which must have had something fearful in its character, since the Baroness returned always in a state of physical prostration, ragged, half-dead, and that weeks of rest alone could restore her after the hideous labors of those few days. This was the purport of the old servant's disclosures to the young Baron, who believed that in so doing he was only fulfilling his duty. The son, anxious at any sacrifice to know the truth of this account, had that very year ascertained it first by following his mother to Baden, and then by penetrating on her track into the gorges of the Black Forest. The footsteps which Sebalt had tracked in the woods were his. When the baron had thus imparted his knowledge to me, I thought I ought not to conceal from him the mysterious influence which the appearance of the old woman in the neighborhood of the castle exercised over the count nor the other circumstances of this unaccountable series of events we were both amazed at the extraordinary coincidence between the facts narrated the mysterious attraction which these beings unconsciously exercised the one over the other the tragic drama which they performed in union the familiarity which the old woman had shown with the castle and its most secret passages without any previous examination of them the costume which she had discovered in which to carry out this secret act, 
and which could only have been rummaged out of some mysterious retreat revealed to her by the strange instinct of insanity finally we were agreed that there are unknown unfathomed depths in our being and that the mystery of death is not the only secret which god has veiled from our eyes although it may seem to us the most important but the darkness of night was beginning to yield to the pale tints of early dawn a bat was sounding the departure of the hours of darkness with a singular note resembling the gurgling of liquid from a narrow bottleneck a neighing of horses was heard far up the defile then with the first rays of dawn we distinguished a sledge driven by the baron's servant its bottom was littered with straw on this the body was laid i mounted my horse who seemed not sorry to use his limbs again which had been numbed by standing upon ice and snow the whole night through i rode after the sledge to the exit from the defile when after a grave salutation the usual token of courtesy between the nobility and the people they drove off in the direction of hersland and i rode towards the towers of nidic at nine i was in the presence of mademoiselle odile to whom i gave a faithful narrative of all that had taken place then repairing to the count's apartments i found him in a very satisfactory state of improvement he felt very weak as was to be expected after the terrible shocks of such crises as he had gone through but had returned to the full possession of his clear faculties and the fever had left him the evening before there was therefore every prospect of a speedy cure a few days later seeing the old lord in a state of convalescence i expressed a desire to return to fribourg but he entreated me so earnestly to stay altogether at nidic and offered me terms so honourable and advantageous that i felt myself unable to refuse compliance with his wishes i shall long remember the first boar hunt in which i had the honour to join with the count and especially the magnificent return home in a torchlight procession after having sat in the saddle for twelve hours together i had just had supper and was going up into hugh lupus's tower completely knocked up when passing sperver's room whose door was half open shouts and cries of joy reached my ears i stopped when the most jovial spectacle burst upon me around the massive oaken table beamed twenty square rosy faces bright and ruddy with health and fun the hob and knobbing of the glasses gave out an incessant tinkling and clattering there was sitting sperver with his bossy forehead his moustaches bedewed with rhenish wine his eyes sparkling and his grey hair rather disordered at his right was marie lagoutte on his left knapwurst he was raising aloft the ancient silver gilt and chaste goblet dimmed with age and on his manly chest glittered the silver plate of his shoulder belt for according to his custom on a hunting day he was still wearing the uniform of his office the colour of marie lagoutte's cheeks rather redder even than usual told of an evening of jollity and her broad cap frills seemed as if they were wanting to fly all abroad she sat laughing now with one then with another knapwurst squatting in his armchair with his head on a level with sperver's elbow looked like a big pumpkin then came tobias offenlach so red that you would have thought he had bathed his face in the red wine leaning back with his wig upon the chair back and his wooden leg extended under the table farther on loomed the melancholy long face of sebalt who was peeping with a sickly smile into the bottom of his wine glass besides these worthies there were present the waiting people men and women servants comprising all that little community which springs up around the board of the great people of the land and belongs to them as the ivy and the moss and the wild convolvulus belong to the monarch of the forests upon the groaning board lay a vast ham displaying its concentric circles of pink and white then among the gaily patterned plates and dishes came the long-necked bottles containing the produce of the vineyards that border the broad and flowing rhine long german pipes with little silver chains and long shining blades of steel the light of the lamp 
shed over the whole scene its amber-coloured hue and left in the shade the old grey and time-stained walls where hung in ample numbers the brazen convolutions of the hunting horns and bugles what an original picture the vaulted roof was ringing with the joyous shouts of laughter sperver as i have already told was lifting high the full bumper and singing the song of black hatto the burgrave i am king on these mountains of mine while the rosy dew of Affenthal hung trembling from his long moustaches. As soon as he caught sight of me, he stopped, and holding out his hand, Fritz, said he, we only wanted you. It is a long time since I felt so comfortable as I do tonight. You are welcome, old boy. As I gazed upon him with surprise, for since the death of Liverle I had never seen him smile, he added more seriously, We are celebrating the return of Monseigneur to his health, and Knapwurst is telling us stories. All the guests turned my way, and I was saluted with kindly welcomes on all sides. I was dragged in by Sebalt, seated near Marie Lagout, and found a large glass of bohemian wine in my hand before I could quite understand the meaning of it all. The old hall was echoing with merry peals of laughter, and Sperver, throwing his arm around my neck, holding his cup high, and with an attempt at gravity which showed plainly that the wine was up in his head, he shouted, Here is my son, he and I, I and he, until death. Here's the health of Dr. Fritz. Knapwurst, standing as high as he was able upon the seat of his armchair, not unlike a turnip, half divided in two, leaned towards me and held me out his glass. Marie Lagoutte shook out the long streamers of her cap, and Sebalt, upright before his chair, as gaunt and lean as the shade of the wild Jaeger amongst the heather, repeated, Your health, Dr. Fritz, whilst the flakes of silvery foam ran down his cup and floated gently down upon the stone-flagged floor. Then there was a moment's silence every guest drank then with a single clash every glass was set vigorously down upon the table bravo cried sperver then turning to me fritz we have already drunk to the health of the count and of mademoiselle odile you will do the same twice had i to drain the cup before the vigilant eyes of the whole table then i too began to look grave could it have been drunken gravity? A luminous radiance seemed shed on every object. Faces stood out brightly from the darkness and looked more nearly upon me. In truth, there were youthful faces and aged, pretty, and ugly, but all alike beamed upon me kindly and lovingly and tenderly. But it was the youngest, at the other end of the table, whose bright eyes attracted me, and we exchanged long and wistful glances, full of affection and sympathy. Sperver kept on humming and laughing. Suddenly, putting his hand upon the dwarf's misshapen back, he cried, Silence! Here is Knapwurst, our historian and chronicler. He is preparing to speak. This hump holds all the history of the House of Nidic from the beginning of time. The little hunchback, not at all indignant at so ambiguous a compliment, directed his benevolent eyes upon the face of the huntsman, and replied, You, Sperver, you are one of the writers whose story I have been telling you. You have the arm and the courage and the whiskers of a writer of old. If that window opened wide, and a writer was to hold out his hand at the end of his long arm to you, what would you say to him? I would say you are welcome, comrade. Sit down and drink. You will find the wine just as good, and the girls just as pretty, as they were in the days of old Hugh Lupus. Look! And he pointed with his glass at the jolly young faces that brightened the farther end of the table. Certainly the damsels of Nidic were lovely. Some were blushing with pleasure to hear their own praises. Others half veiled their rosy cheeks with their long drooping eyelashes, while one or two seemed rather to prefer to display their sweet blue eyes 
by raising them to the smoky ceiling. I wondered at my own insensibility that I had never before noticed these fair roses blooming in the towers of the ancient manor. Silence! cried Sperver for the second time. Our friend Knapwurst is going to tell us again the legend he related to us just now. Won't you have another instead? asked the hunchback. No, I like this best. I know better ones than that. Knapwurst, insisted the huntsman, raising his finger impressively. I have reasons for wishing to hear the same again and no other. Cut it shorter if you like. There is a great deal in it. Now, Fritz, listen. The dwarf, rather under the influence of the sparkling wine he had taken, rested his elbows on the table, and with his cheeks clutched in his bony fingers and his eyes starting from his head with his concentrated efforts to speak with becoming seriousness, he cried as if he were publishing a proclamation. Bernard Herzog relates that the Burgrave Hugh, surnamed Lupus, or the Wolf, when he was old, used to wear a cowl, which was a kind of knitted cap that covered in the crest of the knight's helmet when engaged in fighting. When the helmet tired him, he would take it off and put on the knitted cowl, and its long cape fell around his shoulders. Up to his eighty-second year, Hugh still wore his armor, though he could hardly breathe in it. Then he sent for Otto of Burlock, his chaplain, his eldest son Hugh, his second son Berthold, and his daughter, the red-haired Bertha, wife of a Saxon chief named Bluderick, and said to them, Your mother, the she-wolf, has bequeathed you her claws. Her blood flows mingled with mine in your veins. In you the wolf's blood will flow from generation to generation. It shall weep and howl among the snows of the black forest. Some will say, Hark, the wind howls. Others, No, it is the owl hooting. But not so. It is your blood, mine and the blood of the she-wolf, who drove me to murder Hedviga, my wife before God and the church. She died under my bloody hands. Cursed be the she-wolf, for it is written, I will visit the sins of the fathers upon the children. The crime of the father shall be visited upon the children until justice shall have been satisfied. Then old Hugh the wolf died. From that dreary day the north wind has howled across the wilds, and the owl has hooted in the dark, and travellers by night know not that it is the blood of the she-wolf weeping for the day of vengeance that will come, whose blood will be renewed from generation to generation, so says Herzog, until the day when the first wife of Hugh, Hedviga the Fair, shall reappear at Nidic under the form of an angel to comfort and to forgive. Then Sperver, rising from his seat, took a lamp and demanded of Knapwurst the keys of the library, and beckoned to me to follow him. We rapidly traversed the long dark gallery, then the armory, and soon the archive chamber appeared at the end of the great corridor. All noises had died away in the distance. The place seemed quite deserted. Once or twice I turned round and could then see, with a creeping feeling of dread, our two long fantastic shadows in ghostly fashion writhing in strange distortions upon the high tapestry. Sperver quickly opened the old oak door, and with torch uplifted, his hair all bristling in disorder and excited features, walked in the first. Standing before the portrait of Hedviga, whose likeness to the young countess had struck me at our first visit to the library, he addressed me in these solemn words. Here is she who was to return to comfort and pity me. She has returned. At this moment she is downstairs with the old count. Look well, Fritz. Do you recognize her? Is it not Odile? Then, turning to the picture of Hugh's second wife, There, he said, is Huldina the she-wolf. For a thousand years she has wept 
in the deep gorges amongst the pine forests of the Schwarzwald. She was the cause of the death of poor Liverle, but henceforward the lords of Nidic may rest securely, for justice is done, and the good angel of this lordly house has returned. End of chapter 13 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista End of The Man-Wolf by Emile Erkman and Alexandra Chatrion.